suck. Oh, hey there. You just caught me singing one of my favorite duck movie related songs. And that can mean only one thing. It's a new season of Pick 6 Movies. What's Pick 6 Movies? Why, that's this. It's a podcast about movies. In this particular podcast about movies, we pick a theme and then select six movies based around that theme. This is the very beginning of season 17, a season we call Comic Sans Quality. Oh, we've explored the world of comic book movies before, but this is a wide open field this time around, so we're kicking things off with a movie that is way worse than it sounds, Howard the Duck. But wait a second, who's this we you keep hearing about? Well, I'm Bo Ransdell, one half of the we, and along with my pal Chad Cooper, we come together to form some kind of beast with two spoiled brains, dedicated to watching bad movies, whipping a little information on you, and then explaining why you probably shouldn't see the movie we spent literal hours examining. Wait, is that right? That seems like a bad idea. But no time to examine the psychic tools these movies take on us. It's time for Chad to spin a yarn, for me to up the dosage on the Wellbutrin, and to welcome you good folks to the premiere episode of Season 17, Comic Sans Quality, a movie we like to call Howard the Duck, on account of that's its title. Ugh. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, as we know it today, began back when Marvel Studios decided to produce their own movies, and they kicked things off with Iron Man. At the time this decision was made, Iron Man wasn't as famous as he is today. Most of the general public had never heard of Tony Stark, and taking a gamble on this new superhero odyssey was not considered to be the recipe for box office gold that it is today. The gamble, of course, paid off, and it opened the door to the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe that included other popular superheroes like Captain America and Thor and the Incredible Hulk, each of which had some name recognition and were all known superheroes that audiences were happy to line up and hand over their hard-earned money to watch these doers of good do some good. All these A-list superheroes teamed up with Black Widow and Hawkeye, and they landed on the silver screen in 2012 in Marvel's The Avengers. And audiences couldn't get enough of these superheroes zipping around in the air, shooting evil robots and intergalactic aliens and mega-sized monsters. So, once again, Marvel Studios decided to take another chance on a group of superheroes that included a gun-toting and talking raccoon and a lovable walking tree with a three-word vocabulary. This, of course, was Guardians of the Galaxy, which hit theaters in 2014. But the movie's inception began years earlier. Writers and film producers working with Marvel were given the opportunity to dive into the deep collection of Marvel characters to craft stories that would weave into a larger integrated storyline. James Gunn was eventually brought in to rewrite the script for Guardians of the Galaxy and to direct that film as well as curate a soundtrack of songs from the 1970s that really helped to define that movie in a way that other Marvel movies had not. Guardians of the Galaxy landed in theaters in August of 2014, and it was a huge hit, taking in $773 million worldwide, making it the third highest grossing Marvel movie at that time. This success surprised a lot of people because most folks going to the movies didn't really know who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. They didn't know these characters before seeing the film, unlike all of the other successful Marvel movies at that time. And just like every other Marvel movie coming out, Guardians of the Galaxy had a post credit scene. And what audiences saw at the end of this action-packed and emotionally touching epic space opera surprised some and confused others. The end credit scene for Guardians of the Galaxy was originally going to include the introduction of the characters Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, but then Captain America Winter Soldier stole that idea for the end credits of that movie. James Gunn and the team working on the movie had some footage not used in the final edit of the film, and they needed to come up with something that they could tag onto their movie's ending, and then inspiration hit. Credits stop, fade in. The camera pans across the wrecked ruins of the Collector's Trophy Room, which was destroyed earlier in the film. We see the Collector, as played by Benicio Del Toro, sitting, injured, and drinking from a green cup. A dog wearing an astronaut suit comes over and licks the Collector's face. An off-screen voice asks, What do you let it lick you like that for? Cut to sitting on the ledge of a shattered display case, also sipping from a green glass, is Howard the Duck. Gross. 
be a bird's going down. <sighs> For audience members who knew Howard the Duck, it was a surprising deep cut cameo to a mostly unknown Marvel character that maybe hinted at Marvel resurrecting this character to star in his very own motion picture for the second time. Now, if you're like most people, you probably don't even know who Howard the Duck is or how he fits into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Let's start off and get one thing out of the way. Howard the Duck is not a superhero. He has zero superpowers. He doesn't have super strength. He can't turn invisible. Howard the Duck is just an anthropomorphic duck that walks around and talks and smokes cigars, and he participates in politically and socially conscious commentary. That's it. That's all that he does. Howard the Duck was the creation of Steve Gerber and illustrator Val Myrick. Back in the 1970s, Gerber was working as a copywriter for an ad agency. But since his teenage years, he'd always been a comic book guy, writing and illustrating self-published works. Throughout his formative years, Gerber would send his work to Roy Thomas, who was someone that Gerber knew from growing up in Missouri, and Thomas was employed by Marvel Comics. Now remember, this was Marvel Comics of the 1970s, which is a very different Marvel comic than the one you think of today. Roy Thomas eventually gave Gerber a job freelance writing for some fledgling comic titles, which gave Gerber an outlet to take his personality and infuse it into the comic book medium. Gerber was one of the writers at the time who thought comic books could do more and say more, be more substantial through an existential and at times absurd perspective. Gerber started out writing on a comic called Adventures into Fear, featuring a character called Man-Thing, which was a knockoff of Swamp Thing. Gerber took his assignments and he wrote stories that were analogous to current day political and social environments, but he included witches or a ghost clown or maybe a racist cop or some demons. He actually created the character of Superman in the body of a grown adult, but with the mental capabilities of an infant. That's crazy. Can you imagine the most powerful man on earth, but he has the mental faculties of a child and constantly acts like an under developed, selfish, loudmouth baby? <laughs> oh, comic books, you're crazy. So Gerber's doing some good work, and sales of this comic start to pick up, and eventually he's given the opportunity to write his own comic book that was solely focused on Man-Thing. And to make the jump from Adventures in Fear featuring Man-Thing, Gerber wrote a bit where a barbarian hopped from one dimension to another via a jar of peanut butter, which that kind of stuff was characteristic of Gerber's absurdist writing in general. In this inaugural issue of Man-Thing, Gerber introduced a group of characters that would help fix something to do with multiple universes, which seems to always be happening in comic books. Anyway, among these characters was none other than Howard the Duck. Chomping on a cigar, wearing a dress shirt, tie, and a sports coat, Man-Thing followed this storyline about multiverses colliding, and Gerber's boss, Roy Thomas, felt that Howard the Duck was too much out of place for what was otherwise a horror comic. And so Thomas asked Gerber to kill off Howard the Duck, which he did, and fans of the comic book kind of flipped out. See, unbeknownst to the creators of Man-Thing, comic book readers really loved the sarcastic loudmouth waterfowl, and they wrote letters demanding that Howard be brought back to the pages of the comics, which Marvel happily did. Howard the Duck got his own comic book, which hit the stands on January of 1976, and it sold out immediately. Howard the Duck was everything a superhero comic book was not. He had no powers. He didn't have a secret identity. Heck, he wasn't even human. Howard didn't live in a major metropolitan metropolitan area like New York or Metropolis. Howard the Duck was transported across dimensions to find himself in Cleveland, Ohio. Howard the Duck did know Whack Fu, which apparently Stan Lee loved because of course he did. Howard the Duck was a foul-mouthed, ill-tempered mallard set in a world reflective of a film noir setting. Observing and commenting on American society and pop culture led Howard the Duck to actually make a run for the United States presidency in 1976, where he reportedly received thousands of write-in votes. Howard the Duck lived with the curvaceous and his sometimes girlfriend, Beverly Schweitzer. He was an oversexed intellectual anti-hero who dealt with his own existential crisis. He denounced violence. He had a nervous breakdown and eventually rejected all of his friends and just set out on his own to forget his past filled with purposeless fights. 
Howard the Duck also didn't wear pants and was often seen wearing a blue jacket and a little blue hat. This outfit resembled the ensemble of another famous ill-tempered duck owned by the Disney Corporation. I am speaking, of course, of the one and only Donald Duck. Disney felt that Howard the Duck was way too similar to Donald Duck. And if you take some of the early illustrations of Howard the Duck, put them side by side with Donald Duck, it's a little hard to tell them apart at times. So the fine folks at Disney, aka their team of lawyers, they went to creator Steve Gerber and offered some suggestions on how Marvel could, nay should, change Howard the Duck to look less like Donald Duck. These changes included adjustment to Howard's eyes, eyebrows, his duck bill, the shape of Howard head and oh yeah howard the duck needed to put on pants and his feet should have toes marvel not wanting to nor having the funds to fend off a lawsuit from disney agreed but the creative team behind howard the duck felt that they had to come up with a way to explain this new look of their character so to do this gerber wrote an issue of the comic where howard the duck and his roommate and sometimes girlfriend beverly Schweitzer get involved in a protest over pet decency a movement saying that all animals must now wear pants. This issue of the comic included the walking, talking Howard the Duck, where a fist fight breaks out and Howard and Beverly run off to find safe haven with a character named Wally Sidney, a failed cartoonist who made his money by selling clothes to animals in a store called Sydneyland. The last name Sydney, of course, being the word Disney with the DNS swapped out in places. And really the whole thing was a big middle finger to the company that had all of the power and forced Howard the Duck to put on some pants. Howard the Duck's popularity grew so large that the comic book served as the first, but certainly not the last appearance, of the rock band Kiss in their comic book form, and popularity of the character eventually landed him a daily comic strip in newspapers across the country. This increased demand for new comic strip creative and comic book creative led Gerber, who was notorious for missing deadlines, to miss even more deadlines. So Gerber was taken off the duties of writing the comic strip. They fired him. And he focused more on the primary comic book. Somebody over at Marvel thought it would be a good idea to license out Howard the Duck to appear in other media, film or television or animation. Gerber was not asked to be part of these conversations as Marvel felt they didn't need him to be part of these conversations because Marvel wasn't going to pay him for any of this new exposure of Howard the Duck, the character that Gerber created but Marvel owned. Gerber responded, Hey, this sounds like a bunch of bullshit. I created Howard the Duck. I'm the owner of this character. Marvel Comics, I'll see you in court. And it turns out that Gerber was wrong, Marvel owned Howard the Duck, and that case was eventually dismissed. So with all of these legal unpleasantries put to rest, amidst the smoldering of burned bridges and a lot of blood in the water, Marvel decided it was time to go capitalize on the cult following of Howard the Duck. The story of how Howard the Duck came to the big screen really starts with three people. Willard Hike, his wife Gloria Katz, who were both screenwriters and fans of the comic book. Hike and Katz wrote the screenplays for American Graffiti, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and they lent their talents to doing some touch-up work on Star Wars. Now what do all three of those movies have in common? That's right, Harrison Ford was in all of those movies. But what else do they have in common? That's also right, George Lucas. Hike and Katz first came across Howard the Duck in a comic book store while they were doing some post-production work on the first Star Wars movie. They'd often talk with George Lucas about the idea of bringing Howard the Duck to the big screen. So around 1983, George Lucas, who was also a fan of Howard the Duck, he just completed the Star Wars trilogy with Return of the Jedi just destroying the box office. Lucas was looking for his next big project and he decided to come on board and executive produce a film adaptation of Howard the Duck. Lucas went over to Universal Pictures to see if they would be interested in distributing the movie as they'd passed up on partnering on the Indiana Jones film franchise. Studio heads at Universal took a look at the proposed film and said, Talking duck, you say? Out of space? Laser beams? Alien monsters? Wait, are those assholes at Paramount interested? They are? Screw them! Welcome to Universal Pictures. Now go make us some money. I mean, go make us a movie. 
So Hike and Cat set to writing the screenplay, and they proposed that the movie be an animated film. But the top brass at Universal Pictures didn't care for that idea because animated movies were made for and marketed to kids at the time, and more importantly, they were not known to be very financially successful. The decision was made that Howard the Duck would be a live action film. Ike and Katz would both write the film, Katz would produce, and her husband would direct the movie just like he did when he wrote and directed the film Best Defense, starring Dudley Moore and Eddie Murphy. Ooh. George Lucas wanted to feature Howard the Duck as a fully computerized character, but technological limitations prevented this from happening. Instead, the production crew created a cutting-edge puppet that could be operated by radio controls with an actor inside the duck costume. All of the electronics to control Howard the Duck's eye movement and facial reactions and the duck bill opening and closing as he spoke, well, all of the electronics were held in the duck's ass part of the costume. Multiple actors who were small enough to fit inside Howard the Duck's costume were employed during the shooting, including a 12-year-old boy, Jordan Prentice, and Ed Gale, who at the time was 22 years old and made his big screen debut as Howard the Duck. Gale would go on to play Chucky in Child's Play and Child's Play 2 and Child's Play 3. He was also stationed in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Let's get back to Howard the Duck. To complicate things, Disney's legal team was purposefully consulted to make sure that once again, Howard the Duck did not infringe on the look of Donald Duck. This all led to ongoing delays in final production of the Howard the Duck costume. Now, the voice of Howard the Duck was provided by Chip Zine, who was known more for his performance as Baker in the original Broadway production of Into the Woods. Filmmakers considered getting John Cusack or Martin Short to voice Howard the Duck, but ultimately they decided that casting an actor or comedian with a recognizable voice wasn't the way they wanted to go. Instead, they selected someone who had a natural sounding voice to make Howard the Duck, you know, more of a regular, normal, anthropomorphic duck. To play Howard's roommate and sometimes girlfriend, Beverly, filmmakers considered multiple people to play the role, including Cindy Lauper and Tori Amos, but the role ultimately went to Leah Thompson, who was fresh off Back to the Future and was really a rising star. Jeffrey Jones was brought in to play the movie's bad guy? We'll get into that when Bo shows up a little later. Jeffrey Jones at the time had appeared in the film Amadeus, which won all of the Academy Awards the year that movie came out. He had also previously appeared in Rodney Dangerfield's film Easy money. Guess which one of those two movies I've seen the most? Here's a hint. It's not Amadeus. Fun fact, in 1986, the same year that Howard the Duck landed in the box office, Jeffrey Jones also appeared as Mr. Rooney, the principal in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Unfun fact, in 2002, Jeffrey Jones was arrested for possession of child pornography and accused of asking a 17-year-old boy to pose naked for photographs. Hmm. This introduction just took a strange turn into the seedy part of town. Let's get back on the main road, shall we? Hike said in an oral history of Howard the Duck, published over on Decider.com, that originally the script wasn't going to be an origin story. George Lucas himself wanted Howard the Duck to just be a private investigator in Hawaii. But studio head stepped in and said, A talking duck in Hawaii? Solving crimes? How the hell did he get there? Explain that to the audience. They won't understand what's going on. And hurry up! This movie comes out next summer! The movie started shooting in October of 1985, with a release date set for the summer of the following year. The movie had a budget of around 38 million bucks. Now, you may wonder, is that a lot of money for a movie in the mid-80s? Well, Return of the Jedi had a budget of 32 million dollars. That's right, Howard the Duck had a production budget that was almost 20% higher than that of Return of the Jedi. When the movie made its way into theaters, it pulled in just 16 million bucks in the United States and about 22 million overseas. That barely covered the production costs and didn't come anywhere near picking up the tab for distribution and marketing. Speaking of marketing, the film's marketing campaign was all over the place, starting with a teaser trailer in theaters where Leah Thompson, as Beverly, seductively lays on the ground and talks about having sex with Howard the Duck. You don't believe me. You know what? Um, in the booth, play play track 7H. You know, he's the most exciting individual I've ever met. He isn't into the whole macho thing, but he knows who he is and what he wants. 
Everyone thinks of him as a hero now. But I share his feelings, and he's touched my soul. And right now, I would give anything to run my fingers through his... <sighs> feathers. George Lucas presents an electrifying new comedy, Howard the Duck. More adventure than humanly possible. More adventures than humanly possible? What does that even mean? Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, Chad, take it easy. They're just having a little fun, trying to build up some buzz around this movie, and, and I get that. But in the full trailer, this is how they sold the movie to audiences. Guys, play track 6G. Across the sea of stars lies another world, a world almost exactly like ours. This is where he lives. He's 27 years old, single but searching. Favorite sports, windsurfing and Aikido. Favorite pastimes, cigars and sex. He has everything except fulfillment. And then one night, it happens. Hey, good buddy, are you home? He has a very sudden midlife crisis. He lands in Cleveland. You do know why you were sent to me? Listen to me, small visitor. I can explain how you got here. Maybe you're here for some greater purpose, some cosmic cause. Here, he's forced to reassess his career goals. You went to med school? To explore new relationships. <coughs> to redefine his self-image. I'm sorry, we don't allow pets on the premises. To adjust to a changing lifestyle. Oh, I pull it out! Until he discovers just who he really is. Oh, no. A duck in big trouble. That's a duck, man! Howard the Duck, trapped in a world he never made. Cigars? Sex? Midlife crisis? Reassessing your career goals? Now look, what you didn't see by just hearing that ad is Howard the Duck is drinking beer. He's sticking his hands up a woman's skirt and Leah Thompson is crawling around on a fold-out bed in her underwear. The movie has a duck puppet, so it's for kids, right? But he drinks beer and has sex and is considering a career change? And we're in Cleveland, Ohio? But it's in outer space and it's a comedy? Who is this movie for exactly? And also, they don't ever show Howard the Duck at all in the trailer because, well, they didn't want people to know what he looked like. You could hear him, though, especially if you paid for it. See, in the 1980s, 1-900 numbers were all the rage. These were phone numbers where people, mostly men, called up and gave their credit card numbers, and then they would have people talk dirty to them over the phone. There were other instances where you could call and do a psychic reading or whatever, but it was mostly people calling up and having people say dirty stuff to them while they did whatever they did. So naturally, it made sense for Howard the Duck to have a 1-900 number where you could call and hear Howard the Duck tell you about the movie and the characters, and you would hear a bunch of terrible duck puns, and all of this was intercut together with audio Video clips from the actual movie and since we're playing so many clips here hey play j4 no j5 play j5 that one's better <laughs> greetings again earth friends and thank you for calling me howard the duck star of universal pictures new movie you know i thought it would be a good idea for you to get to know some of my film friends for hairless apes they're really a pretty good group let's start with that famous scientist phil blumberg phil say hello Nice ducky. Me, Phil. You, Howard. We be friends. Don't mind him. He's been spending too much time in the lab lately. Phil Z, do you think the movie's going to be a smash hit? Theoretically, yes. Unfortunately, it's never been tested. Yeah, I see. Uh, how would you describe it? <laughs> I've just seen it. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Once again, science takes another giant step forward. A buck ninety-nine a minute to hear that on the phone. But that was not the most bizarre way this movie was marketed. Budweiser, the king of beers, was named as Howard the Duck's beverage of choice. And in an actual movie poster for Howard the Duck, there are two hands. 
one holding a giant can of Budweiser beer that fills up almost half the poster, and the other one is holding a cigar. At the top, there's a tagline that reads, all he wants is a good beer, a cigar, and a one-way ticket home. The movie had a music video for the Howard the Duck theme song, which was written by Thomas Dolby and George Clinton sans the P-Funk All-Stars. Now the theme song, which is surprisingly catchy, mostly because it sounds like a ripoff of Prince's Let's Go Crazy, well, in the music video, future Oscar-winning actor Tim Robbins, oh yeah, I forgot to mention he's in this movie too, he mugs for the camera and he talks to Howard the Duck at the beginning, who is never shown at all. You just see his hands and he's shot from the back while sitting in a chair. And again, I only bring all of this up because the marketing of this film never included Howard the Duck. Film Filmmakers didn't want you to see him. Maybe it was that they wanted to build a sense of mystery, or perhaps it was because the studio didn't have faith in the character. When the film came out, fans of the comic book hated the movie. People who went to see it with no knowledge of the movie's source material walked away confused or shocked or probably just pissed off that they wasted their money. The failure of Howard the Duck forced the resignation of Universal Production Chief Frank Price one month after the film's release. In a statement at the time, Price said, you're gonna fire me? Bullshit! I quit! Screw you! You know, we may need to check our sources on that quote. At the time, Marvel Comics, who released an adaptation of the movie and comic book form, also released a new issue of Howard the Duck that didn't include Steve Gerber's participation at all. Well, in this new issue, Howard the Duck finds himself coping with all of his fame from the release of his super popular movie, Oh, the Irony. Steve Gerber and Val Myrick, who created Howard the Duck, were not involved in the film at all. And when comparing what was in the comic books to what ended up on the screen, it's clear they had nothing to do with the latter. Howard the Duck did a number on George Lucas as well. It pointed out the limitations of computer graphic technology and cinema at the time, and he was kind of short on cash, and he needed to pump a little bit of money back into Lucasfilm, so George Lucas sold off the graphics group, the computer graphics division within his company, to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, having just been fired from Apple, took the graphics group and turned it into a little company called Pixar. Maybe you heard of it? That's right, Howard the Duck, in its own way, is responsible for every single Pixar movie ever made. And there are also talks of Howard the Duck showing up in future Marvel projects, spanning ideas from his own animated series to getting a new feature film where Leah Thompson has expressed interest in sitting in the director's chair this go round. But I'm not sure that any of that's such a good idea. Howard the Duck is a vulgar, opinionated, and mostly unlikable character. His adventures are a means to provide commentary on culture, pointing out the flaws and hypocrisy that can best be seen from an outsider's point of view. His appeal is not suited for mass audiences because they're often the target of his beratement and harsh criticism. Will Howard the Duck return to the big screen? Maybe. But considering that Howard the Duck's feet had human toes and he was wearing pants in that last scene of Guardians of the Galaxy, I doubt that any future version of Howard the Duck would resemble the version that Steve Gerber and Val Myrick created over 40 years ago. But what of the Howard the Duck movie itself? Is it a quote, flawed triumph that comes tantalizingly close to capturing the acerbic brilliance of its creator's early comic book adventures as delusionally observed by Michael H. Price with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram after one assumes suffering multiple concussions? Or is the film as Dave Kerr of the Chicago Tribune observed, quote, absent anything resembling structure, character, point of view, or sense of purpose? Well, to answer those questions, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to discuss this movie as we begin this comic book movie adaptation theme season of Pick 6 Movies. Ladies and gentlemen, Ducks and Drakes, we proudly present to you 1986 fantastic flop, Howard the Duck. And welcome 
to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, who has an asshole that is watertight, Mr. Bo Ransdell. How are you doing this evening? Oh, I'm excellent. <laughs> See what I did there? I did uh, a, an egg pun. This is season 17. Can you believe it? Because I can't. It seems like a big number. It is. Especially when you consider there are six episodes contained within each season. And look, I'm no mathematician, Chad. No. But that's got to be like a hundred uh, million episodes. It feels like it. <laughs> uh, what, not to pull the curtain back too quickly on this one, but this is a movie that I think both of us, on paper, this seems like such a good fit for us. It absolutely does. But then it's time to watch the movie. I had seen this movie when I was a kid. I remember nothing about it. That's what happens during traumatic events as a child. You block it out. <laughs> the thing about it was when I went back to watch it again, I should say I watched Jaws 3D with a friend of mine. But when it came to Howard the Duck, I was like, I don't think you want any part of this. Like Jaws 3 is one thing, but this I feel like is a, is entirely another. So I watched it by myself. I fell asleep at a point in the movie and woke up and I was like, oh my God, I must have been out for like 30 minutes because this movie has taken a dramatic shift. That was not the case, Chad. I nodded off for about <laughs> 10 <laughs> I was suddenly in a different movie. <laughs> a lot of movie reviews that we do on this show start with the question, is this the worst movie we've ever reviewed? And I think it's because we're in the moment, the movie's fresh on our minds, and we're unable to accurately compare its quality or lack thereof to other movies that we've reviewed in the past. But having said that, Bo, is this the worst movie we've ever reviewed on this podcast? Man, it comes awfully close. This is a movie whose reputation precedes it. And that reputation is completely legitimate. It, it's not that the movie is just bad. It's bad on every level. The, the casting is bad. The writing is bad. The special effects are bad. The acting is bad. The pacing is bad. The music is bad. No matter how you turn this thing over, it's just bad from all sides. It's one of those movies that when you reach the end of it, you really start to question your decisions about life and how you're living it. And the time that you've got left. And I mean, I can honestly say, like, we don't have to save this till the end. I do not recommend anyone see this movie. And I will hopefully forget it as quickly as possible. Thanks to the, <laughs> the bottle of tequila. I've got riding <laughs> shotgun with me for this episode tonight, Chad. I plan to be at the bottom of it. <laughs> So our movie starts off, and we're in what appears to be New York City. But as the camera pans across the skies, we see that there are two moons up above all of the buildings. It's kind of like when Luke Skywalker exited his home on Tatooine. It was kind of cool when you saw it in Star Wars, but here it really feels derivative. Not only that, th this gets to one of the large problems with this movie, which is... <laughs> one of... <laughs> right one of that there's no sense of time or place or is this real is this all fantasy <laughs> the questions that queen has been asking for decades <laughs> like it starts off with this kind of easy saxophone playing yeah it's some sexy jazz saxophone as it's often called yep i don't understand what the tone of this movie is mm -hmm. And that is a nagging problem throughout because the tone goes all over the place. It just starts here where it feels like the first five minutes of the movie is kind of made for adults. There are absolutely parts of this movie that are completely made for adults. And there are other parts of this movie that are made for six-year-olds. And that's the problem. The camera passes all of the buildings and then we move into one of the apartments. And all of the lighting here is a very noir type of scheme. And there are all these dark shadows cascading across the room. Someone enters into the room of this apartment, tosses down a set of keys where we see four framed photos of these female anthropomorphic ducks. So they're like, they're ducks, but they're people. And they're in various states of dress. One of them is wearing a big blonde wig. One looks like a hippie. One looks like she's at a garden party. The other one's just having a good time outside, probably drunk. And we're to assume this is Howard the Duck's apartment. And these are his lady friends. Howard then walks over and hangs up his hat and his umbrella on the wall. And there is a poster behind him for a movie called My Little Chickadee starring May Nest and W.C. Fowles. Yeah. 
The poster also looks like they photoshopped duck bills on the actual faces of Mae West and W.C. Fields. This poster looks like something you would see at a Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> and the camera really lingers on it. So you can really drink in the parody of this moment. Which, by the way, that's the name of the movie. They didn't even change the name of the movie. Right. This is, again, one of the large problems with it is that there's just duck puns everywhere. Again, it begs the question, who is this for? Nobody. <laughs> so, yeah, he lives in Marshington, D.C. How can he live in Marshington, D.C.? We just saw outside it was New York City. The duck world is like our human world, but things are kind of different. So they call New York Marshington, D.C.? Or maybe that's just where his driver's license is from. Right. Well, that's the fake license that he uses to drink, I'm sure. <laughs> they have a District of Columbia in this duck world. Do they have a representative democracy, too? Yeah, it's probably called something terrible, like the U.S. Quackress or something. Do you think abortions are legal in this duck world? And like, like, what about human slavery or human trafficking? Yeah, there's the original sin of duck slavery, almost certainly. What about guns or like nuclear weapons? I want to know the history of this duck planet now. How much of it is like our world? There are so many times that characters that shouldn't know the ins and outs are little throwaway lines that Howard will have, or even later, the Dark Overlord of the Universe. How, do, how are you aware of this as a thing? There's another poster for a movie that we see called Breeders of the Lost Stork. What is this movie about? Is it like a Handmaid's Tale thing? They're forcing female ducks to have babies in that movie? It's just duck porn, Chad. I mean, clearly, the amount of horniness surrounding this <laughs> anthropomorphic duck is really disturbing. I like that on this Indiana Drake movie poster, it says a new hero from the creators of Beaks and Foul Wars. So Beaks is a play on Jaws and Foul Wars is supposed to be Star Wars. So the evolution of cinema and the creative process in this duck world parallels that of Earth, but with bird puns thrown in? That's right. That's the peak of their civilization, Chad. All right. Howard the Duck gets play on his answering machine, and he hears a message from his mother, and she says, Hi, it's your mom. I know you're busy with a new job, but call us. Did you get the sweater we sent you for your birthday? Bye. Oh, it's Howard's birthday, or we're close to it. Then there's a second beep, and it's like, Hey, Howard, it's Jim. Are we still set for racquetball on Saturday? Which I was like, shouldn't it be quacketball? As all these messages are happening, he goes over to his refrigerator and he opens it up and he pulls out a delicious cold Budweiser beer. Budweiser, the king of beers. When you've said Budweiser, you've said it all. Budweiser, proud sponsor of Howard the Duck in theaters everywhere. The thing that we don't get a, a real sense of here is that how everything must be scaled down. Because later when he's handed a beer, he's like, oh, that's a big beer. But he's drinking a Budweiser beer out of little squatty bottles that they used to sell. Oh, I forgot about those. You know, alcohol for kids. I almost forgot that was the thing. Exactly. The third message that comes in is from a female. And she says, hey, Howie, I had a dream last night that I was running my fingers through your feathers. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> why don't you come over and I show you what happened next? Ciao for now, Howie. So Howard the Duck has women throwing themselves at him. And also, we have not seen Howard the Duck's face in this movie so far. It is continuously hidden in the shadows or by the camera being behind him. Howard turns on his TV to watch a bunch of garbage television, and the camera pans over to a wall where we see that Howard was in a band called Howard and the Heartbreakers, and his guitar is up there. And then, Bo, the camera pans over, and we finally get to see Howard the Duck in all of his glory. And he is strange looking. <laughs> yeah, it's a real showbiz pizza place kind of animatronic situation he's got dead eyes man and that's the the toughest thing to get right whether it's video games or animatronics or whatever it's just these haunted dead glassy eyes oh and howard is full of it this puppet's facial acting abilities reminded me a lot of macaulay culkin in home alone because there's a lot of wide eyes and then squinty eyes and then screaming and then when you see howard the duck run around he looks like a little person in a very restrictive costume yeah almost as if that was the case 
he, he looks <laughs> terrible and it never gets better there's he's got this weird puff of feathers on top of his head and if you remember that this movie was made in the 80s it's like oh well that was kind of the hipster style at the time was that poof of hair on top of your head for men and women alike you need to look no further than the thompson twins for evidence of that was there a duck hitler in this world like a duck holocaust a duck hitler that'd be pretty good did the duck version of ronald reagan ignore the duck aids crisis when this movie came out oh almost certainly drove a lot of ducks right into the streets what about duck jesus or duck beetles did they exist i got a lot of questions about this world bo do you because i don't know if the movie would have been better if it were just all set on this duck world or better uh, as a result of him coming to earth i don't know that there's a good answer to that it's like planet of the apes but with ducks right and then at the end he's like get your wings off me you damn dirty drake man if charlton heston had been in duck world in full planet of the apes mode that would have been a movie (laughs) oh my god look at all of you disgusting ducks and then he has sex with one of them oh for sure yeah the one who can't talk because you know it's the 60s (laughs) so howard starts watching trash tv and he turns that off because he wants to look at pornography which he does it's a magazine titled play duck (laughs) <laughs> and um, he unfolds it to look at the centerfold. And here, Bo, we, the audience, see a photograph of a naked woman duck. And she has large, exposed duck breasts. And you can see her big duck nipples. Yeah, and you think, hey, that seems out of line for a movie like this. Oh, just but, wait. Right, yeah, just give it 60 seconds before making any kind of judgment calls about Howard the Duck. Does Howard the Duck masturbate to pornography? With his little duck corkscrew dick, that's another- That's what I want to know. Like, yeah. he's a, I have so many questions about Duck World. Before Howard the Duck can drop his pants to the ground, everything starts shaking in his apartment. And Howard says, oh no, it's a quake. I can't move. And the tiny lounge chair, he's sitting in blast backwards like he's in Dana Barrett's apartment. And he goes zooming down the hallway, crashes through the walls of multiple apartments, Bo, including the apartment of a female duck who is in the bathtub. Uh-huh. And she's naked. Yeah, we get full-on duck tits yet again, only this time not in a magazine. This time it's in the flesh. The camera lingers way too long. How was this movie PG? Team America World Police was almost NC-17 because puppets were having sex with each other and, well, because one of them shit on the other one during sex. But honestly, this movie has two scenes of full frontal nudity and it was rated PG, Bo. But it's duck nudity. And also, two further words, George Lucas. Airplane had nudity in it and it was PG. Right. And Jaws had those big titties on Bad Hat Harry. I still can close my eyes and see those. Those things are terrifying. That's what I masturbate to. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So another thing about the duck tits before we totally leave this planet. Here's who I think this movie is really for when you get right down to it. It's burgeoning furries. You know, it's people that had their sexual awakening when they saw these duck tits Mm -hmm. and they were like, oh my God, I'm into that. And it's unfortunate, but you know, like all of us, Chad, you have those moments where you're like, oh shit, that was the thing I didn't realize I was turned on by, but here we are and for a lot of people apparently it's dressing up like animals and i think howard the duck is a prime example like if you went to a furry convention chad right uh held at your finer holiday ends you are absolutely gonna find outside of the ballroom where everybody's just talking about my little pony or whatever along the the hallway that they have reserved for this convention yep. in every room there is a 70 percent chance that howard the duck is playing at any given moment (laughs) so howard gets pulled up into the sky by this magical force and as he's getting sucked up into space his little lounge chair burns up in the atmosphere and then howard gets pulled into this tube and tossed into space which did they have a duck bible like a christian bible in this duck world would this be like a duck rapture they're all actually followers of gooselam i can't do this bo i'm not forcing myself to come up with stupid duck or zen duck 
I can't help it. Now that I've watched this movie, I'm doing it all the time. I have been struck in the face no less than seven times because of this film. As Howard is flying through space, he starts screaming and he makes his way across the silent void of outer space. And then a narrator shows up to explain what's going on. I said to myself while watching this movie, only to be later disappointed. And this narrator says, outer space, countless worlds upon worlds, worlds without end. In these galaxies, every possible reality exists. Reality on one world is fast fantasy on the others all is real all is an illusion what is what was what will be and in the beginning there was howard the duck and we get the title of the movie they get everything wrong in this film story structure character development they screw everything up in the first five minutes there there was a great book on screenwriting written years ago called save the cat and the whole idea was that you give your character a save the cat moment something that makes you like this character and ultimately root for them through the course of the story hey that guy likes jerking off to porno he's just like me <laughs> that is your entree if you will into the character of howard the duck when i come home from work first thing i do is drink a beer and then jerk off to porno me and this guy we're the same man i love him well i hey, what would you say billy you're not enjoying this movie how about you shut the fuck up let dad enjoy one for once all right we'll Imagine go taking your kid to see this you know he's like seven or eight like are those duck tits, Dad? Yeah, man, that's great. I like looking at them duck titties. High five, Billy. How old are you? You got a boner yet? No? You will. And when you do, you're going to think that's hot as shit. I don't understand why they didn't start the movie with Howard the Duck being down on his luck. Like, he gets fired or his girl leaves him or he can't pay his bills. Like, he's got nothing going for him. And then, boom, he gets sucked up and goes to this new world where he's a fish out of water who's unique and special. And I get that this may not be in exact alignment with the source material, but newsflash and neither is this whole movie. I don't understand why they didn't allow his character to be like a obnoxious, loudmouth, but lovable asshole like Rodney Dangerfield in Caddyshack or like Louis De Palma from Taxi or Rocket Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy. You can have that character, but he's none of that. You know, you pointed this out in the introduction, but Rocket Raccoon gets it right because as brash as he is and kind of unlikable, you also quickly learn, oh, he's the only one of his kind and he's totally alone in the universe. And that makes you root for him because he's clearly hurt by that. And that's another thing you never see Howard the Duck express in this movie is anything resembling an emotion that isn't annoyance or horniness. Howard flies through space and eventually crash lands on Earth in Cleveland, Ohio, that both suspiciously looks like Sacramento and San Francisco. Well, you'd be surprised how often you see a palm tree in Cleveland out of nowhere and, and the great <laughs> desert expanses of Ohio. I'm sure you remember that pretty well. <laughs> when he crashes into Earth, he lands in a different tiny recliner. Why not just have him travel through space in his own chair? It's a fine question. I really don't know because later on in the movie, it's sort of significant that he sees this chair again. But it's not the chair he came to Earth on because that burned up in the atmosphere of Duck World or whatever the hell. He is immediately surrounded by a bunch of glam rock thugs. Mm -hmm. And I fully expected to hear Morgan Freeman say... I wish I could tell you that Howard the Duck fought the good fight and that the sisters let him be. I wish I could tell you that, but Cleveland is no fairy tale world. Howard never said who did it, but we all knew. I like the Tim Robbins connection. <laughs> That makes me happy. <laughs> These glam rock thugs grab Howard the Duck and both they abduct him and take him over to a nightclub immediately. Howard the Duck is taking all of this quite in stride, which is shocking because he's never seen a human being before, to the best of our knowledge. The fact that you are met with the kind of chaotic enthusiasm that the members of Cobra Kai expressed at the end <laughs> of The Karate Kid... Where they're just like, yeah, get him, Johnny. Like that kind of level of, of amphetamine-fueled anger. Where they're just <laughs> grabbing him out of this chair like, yeah, let's go take him to a bar. Which is what happens. They take him across the street to this club where Leah Thompson is playing. When they take him into the bar, the bouncer says, that costume don't fool me. No kids allowed. Excuse me, bouncer. You're suggesting that a, a child put on 
a duck costume to sneak into this bar? Why would a child do that when a trench coat and your friend's shoulders clearly work so well? You know, Chip and Dale have shown us a number of times that just standing on your friend's shoulders is the way to convince others that you're a people's. Yeah, <laughs> if that's a problem, also the fact that they just immediately hand Howard to one of their buddies and are like, hey, we found a date for you. Yeah, and I think the guy's gonna have sex with this duck. 100%, because as soon as the bouncer is like, hey, get out of here. We don't take any little kids in costumes. He's like, oh, no, no, I was gonna have sex with that child in a duck costume. Yeah, a quote from the movie, Chad, is the guy yelling out, hey, that's my date. Oh, the bestiality starts early in this movie, Chad. Hey, Billy, you see that? That guy was gonna fuck that duck, huh? You like this movie so far? How about we get some more popcorn? I don't like this movie, Dad. I want to go home. Yeah, everybody likes this movie. Uh, I can't wait to see what's next. <laughs> Leah Thompson, who has thankfully recovered from her shark attack by in Jaws 3D, she's up on stage and she's singing with her band Cherry Bomb. And it's all harmless 80s girl, light punk rock. You'll find their latest album sandwiched between a Jim and the Holograms and a Josie and the Pussycats LP. Yeah, that's accurate. And so they kind of provide the sound track to the rest of this scene as they sing a song about life in the city or whatnot <laughs> it's immediately forgettable yeah howard when he's thrown out he runs off immediately scares a homeless lady yeah she's got like this bag full of what i'm assuming are dead cats that she calls her babies there's a healthy amount of feces in that purse howard runs down another alleyway he almost gets hit by a truck but the truck goes by and then howard turns around and there's a man making out with what has to be a prostitute because these two don't look drunk enough to be making out in this dank trash filled alley way howard turns around and he puts his hand on this prostitute's thigh and he kind of runs his fingers up her leg pushing her mini skirt higher up towards her butt and then the prostitute screams the john then tries to hit howard on the head with a piece of wood and i'm like hey, is that hacksaw jim duggan yeah it's some kind of street sign or something that just happened to be laying around the alley oh <laughs> run he's got a folding chair oh my god he's got a sign howard this can't be right the refs when are they gonna step in so howard runs off and then he is suddenly being pursued by a female biker gang called satan's sluts according to their leather jackets uh -huh. and they're rolling down the street and howard runs off howard then grabs a hook dangling from a chain and he swings up in the air he kicks a lever that pulls him higher up in the air then he lets go falls down lands on the front of a motorcycle that's being driven by a satan slut and he gets punched bounces over and goes into a trash can you know it's terrifying that we had both of us i think probably had this moment where you had to actually write down the singular of satan's sluts that's where we are in this movie and quite frankly in our lives the song ends with howard being knocked off the front of this motorcycle he ends up in this barrel and he's just like oh boy i'm just gonna stay here talk about a rotten day <laughs> <laughs> so he covers himself up leah thompson is on her way home after singing at the club and is walking by said barrel when a couple of dudes just jump out from the alley and immediately attempt to rape her yes so we've had two instances of potential sexual assault within the first 10 minutes of our film. Yeah, that's what you want in a kid's movie. It, uh, the fact that Bill Cosby did not produce this also, really kind of a stunner. Hey, you like this movie? When we leave here, we're going to go across the way. You go first, and then I'll follow you, and we're, and we're going to go watch The Accused. I'm going to show you something you're really going to like. I'll tell you what, how about on the way home we get you a duck costume and go sneak into a bar. We'll get you a couple drinks in you, then you're going to feel like raping. I don't think so, Dad. I have bad dreams when I go back to Mom. So I have some bad dreams, too. One of them is you talking all the way through this goddamn movie. I'm having a good time. I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet. When we get home, we're going to go over my buddy Dutch's trailer, and he's got a movie called Deliveries, and it's got Smokey and the Bandit in it. This happens to a dude. So I want you to know that can happen to you, too. So you better look out. I got to be honest with you, Billy. If one of these boys here asks her to squeal like a pig, this may be the best movie I've ever seen. Instead of squealing like a pig, Howard the Duck jumps up and he says, every duck has his limit and I'm a master of quack foo. And then Howard the Duck proceeds to beat up these two droogies with some embarrassingly bad fight choreography. How this movie cost more than Return of the Jedi, I can't understand how that happened. And these action sequences are the stuff of like a Nickelodeon family themed situation 
Haitian comedy. It's a lot of hi ya hi cha that move where you grab the bad guy's arm and you twist it and they jump in the air and do a flip and now they're knocked out that kind of stupid shit if this movie were a direct-to-video film in which a dude in a dinosaur suit knew karate it would be no less cheap looking leah thompson tries to help out but she's a woman in a movie from the 80s so the filmmakers are like what's she gonna do let this tiny little duck handle thing i like the fact that one of these droogies when he sees howard yells out i guess i've been doing too much toot is that where you smell other people's farts <laughs> no that's a uh, nose candy oh you know what i'm talking about dennis quaid fuel dennis quaaludes dennis quackludes did they have a duck version of jaws 3d are the sharks ducks uh what are they they're probably geese maybe we've got a lot of questions and hopefully no answers howard looks over at leah thompson and he says uh, where am i where is this place and leah thompson says uh you're in cleveland and he's like that's the name of this planet she's like no 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 you're you're on planet earth cleveland is a city and earth is the planet and i think i'm in a nightmare do you want to come to my apartment dude there is this what can only be described as a romantic moment where at first she's like hey even though i should be really stunned by the fact that there's a walking and talking duck around i'm not so instead i'm just gonna say best of luck bye all right all right i'll figure it out they just stand there in the rain slightly separated mm -hmm. before before she gives him a look and she's like well i've made a lot of bad decisions about men in my life why not one more i think he's a guy anyway hey ducky you want to come back to my place yeah yeah that, that sounds great let's go do that so they go to her apartment which is to call it a studio apartment is to undersell just how shitty it is it looks like an abandoned drug flop house is she renting or squatting it's really yeah. tough to tell the only thing missing are burnt spoons literally the ground and a few errant rubber hoses needed for tying off and in fairness howard the duck is like oh boy this place is a real shithole huh she says well i'm renting it from my manager he doesn't really pay us much and also he's got us locked into this terrible contract is that something that might happen later in this movie yeah yeah probably anyways i've got a band cherry bomb is that important uh, probably not i have no idea uh, hey i just noticed there's no creepy naked mannequins around here to be found that seems a lot out of place you want some milk i can put it in a bowl for you or something uh <laughs> she thinks he's a cat yeah and he's like listen honey i'm not a pet how about a beer uh -huh. and then he runs a foul chad <laughs> of her giant duck purse and he's just like ah yeah what kind of crazy planet you got going on around here can you fuck this thing should i fuck it will i fuck it the answer to the last one's yes. I'm going to lie on my back, and I want you to put this on this corkscrew contraption. Also, Leah Thompson's character, Beverly, in this movie, she's supposed to be this punk band member from the Go-Go's or something, but she looks more like the day manager at a Claire's boutique in the late 80s. She's not edgy. She's just this cliche of big hair and wild makeup and kitschy clothing. And she gives Howard a beer, which, of course, is a Budweiser beer. Budweiser. Chris, cold, refreshing. When you're shacking up in an abandoned drug in and you need refreshment, you reach for just one thing. Cold bottle of Budweiser beer from Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. So he, he has a seat in what passes for a chair in this dump and the seat starts to shake again and he has a straight up like PTSD flashback about being hurtled through space and time to another planet. Ah, not again! Yeah, and she's like, what are you talking about, Ducky? It's just a truck going by. He tells her, after she kind of probes a little bit about what his life was like before he came to planet Earth. So what was it like for you on your planet? Did you have a job? Did you go to, what's that place where you learn things? Jail? No, school. My folks wanted to be a plastic surgeon, but I dropped out and I did construction work in the day and I wrote songs at night, but then I had to grow up and i got a job as an ad copywriter and he picks up this bottle of perfume and is like the only thing that touches my skin is oh de mallard and his hands i wrote that and it's like of course you did because it's the horniest possible way you can sell perfume he says all this like being an advertising copywriter is a bad job it's not. It may not be the job for him, but he's just kind of shitting all over it. Yeah, I mean, it's horribly unethical, but yeah, it's it pays well. Everybody around me said, grow up, you know? And I was like, hey, man, I got news for you. At a certain point, you got to pay your bills. 
You got to buy food. And Leah Thompson's like, oh boy, Howard, it really sounds like you sold out. And I was waiting for him to be like, hey, sold out, more like buying in, sister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you think on this planet, they eventually had a duck version of Mad Men, like Quack Men with Duck Draper? <laughs> we really need to stop. <laughs> also, I couldn't get through the first season of that either. Shame on you. Uh <laughs> After she says that he sold out, I was like, you know what? Selling out isn't a thing anymore. Everybody sells out these days. In fact, being a social media influencer is essentially creating a following so that you can purposefully sell out. That is the whole end game. I'm really interested in seeing what happens to people who were like, you know, social media makeup people in their 20s. But as soon as the makeup doesn't hide the cracks in the skin or the melanomas anymore, what are they going to do? Is that just our future greeters of Walmart? Maybe. Or they invest their money and then, you know, they retire at 28. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They're so good at investments. I mean, look at all the sports stars who have been paid wildly in their 20s and 30s and went on to do nothing but invest wisely howard the duck says you know i feel like there's a special destiny waiting for me out there or something you know what howard the duck is a delusional idiot in this movie yeah he's pushing 30 and he's still yapping about all of his dreams and a special destiny i hate to break this to our protagonist but if he quits swimming around in his own ocean of self-pity maybe he'll realize that he just got physically transported from one dimension to another isn't that pretty unbelievable mr howard the duck an interesting twist in the destiny of your life yeah it seems like that would be something that registered with him but again this movie is just so poorly written screw this place i need to get back home where i'm miserable Th again this is the the furry situation <laughs> where he's like kind of got the hots for leah thompson and the feeling is kind of mutual yeah but they go hot and cold at first he's horny for her then she's horny for him and then her hair which by the way speaking of jim and the holograms could not be more crimped if they crimped it anymore it would burn and fall off <laughs> yeah she would just be bald in this movie like that lady from star trek the motion picture howard has no intention of staying on planet earth and he tells her look i'm not gonna be stranded here all right i gotta get back to my own planet where i got this shitty job and parents who are disappointing me and girls want to come over and do freaky stuff in the sack but uh in those situations i'd rather crank it to a stroke book while drinking a budweiser beer budweiser beer when you open the refrigerator out in the garage of your weird uncle's house there's only one thing you're gonna find the littered remains of a 12-pack of Budweiser beer. Budweiser, the beer of sketchy uncles everywhere. And while Leah Thompson waxes a little philosophical about him having to go back, Howard the Duck just passes out in the window, and she goes over to him and brushes this, you know, Thompson twin bunch of hair on his head, kind of creepily. Uh-huh. And I was like, you know, as much as this is unpleasant to look at, I also kind of get it, because I've met a lot of human men, and she just got sexually assaulted. So maybe in her mind, she's like, I don't Oh, no maybe an anthropomorphic duck is a good guy for me now but you're giving her way too much credit because the next move she does is pick up howard the duck's wallet after it falls out of his pocket and just starts rifling through it which is a real low life move yeah it's why you make prostitutes clap when you leave the room we see his driver's license and you get that his birth date makes him 27 years old and it also says he needs to wear corrective lenses but we never see howard the duck in glasses maybe he wears contacts he's got a master card that's called a mallard card and a blooming ducks account card and everything in this movie is a stupid pun it must be a nightmare to get anything trademarked in this world because every duck word's already been taken their entire economy is probably based <laughs> on copyright infringement lawsuits <laughs> there's a photo in his wallet of howard with two sexy lady beach ducks sadly Bo, their oversized breasts are not exposed dang man i was hoping to see more of them duck titties can you believe that they covered them up well you know what i mean i'm gonna close my eyes yeah, I can see him there. <laughs> How much more of this movie is there? Can we leave yet? No, we can't leave. All right, you can leave. You can go sit in the truck if you want. I don't give a shit. It's not locked. Can't lock it. <laughs> it's so hot outside, though. It's hot out in the truck. Uh, you know what? If you go out to the truck, give the dog some water. He's probably thirsty. And, and crack a window. He wasn't moving when I came in. So as she's rifling through it, she finds another photo of Howard the Duck with his elderly parents. There's some cash in the wallet. They're all $1 bills because Howard's a high roller. And instead of it having George Washington on it, it's this duck equivalent. Like what? George Waddleton? 
<laughs> oh god damn it this speaking of bad photoshop from earlier it's awful it looks like shit but then Bo, she pulls out of the wallet mm -hmm. the pace de resistance yes which is this little duck condom not in a wrapper mind you just loose in the wallet and there's sexy saxophone playing in the background as she pulls it out she goes what am i gonna do with you ducky his open condom is rubbing up against loose paper currency you can't do that that's a good way to get syphilis or whatever they call it on duck world hey baby let's have sex wait i need to rub this condom on a five dollar bill found on the bathroom floor of the bus station you know for good luck don't want you to get pregnant or anything or if you do i want to make sure the kid don't make it Hey, man, I like this guy. He's got all kinds of brilliant ideas. I'm going to rub rubbers on money, too. I wish I'd done that with your mama. You know what I'm saying, Billy? Yeah, I do understand. I wish I wasn't born either. Well, we got that in common. This movie uh, really starting to tick up for you, huh? So she is becoming enamored with Howard the Duck. And she met him, what, 30 minutes ago? So she's a crazy person. Right. Really jumping feet first into this relationship that he is not aware of at the moment. And, and <laughs> so the next day, Leah has Howard in a trash bag. In the backseat of a taxi cab, driving down a street in san francisco ohio <laughs> yeah with holes cut in it like charlie brown's ghost costume they go to the natural history museum of cleveland foreign yeah how did she get him into the back of this taxi cab inside of a trash bag doesn't that raise a couple of eyebrows for the driver or you know he's seen it all this is taxi cab confessions time he's like oh yeah one time this girl got into the back of my car she had some little guy in a trash bag and why is he in the trash bag is it she doesn't want people to see him he was in a bar the night before nobody seemed to give a shit then and why not just put the bag over him and let him walk the only people who freaked out about him was that prostitute when he tried to rock her with the shocker in that nasty alleyway and i don't think it's because he was a duck i think it's because she was about to get you know fingered by more than two hands <laughs> right yeah it's one of those like moments where she's like wait a second where's your other hand between two pillows <laughs> hey baby wink wink and the whole time howard is bitching and moaning about this ah christ i'm gonna have to see a psychiatrist at the very least we're addressing the mental health issues that would come with being thrown from your home across the universe in a world where nobody looks like you and nothing is familiar eh, that's something i guess she takes him to the natural history museum of cleveland fornia to meet her friend phil uh -huh. as played by tim robbins he's a scientist or something a lab technician we learn yeah they enter his office it's one of those shots of like we see them go inside the door closes and then tim robbins comes busting out with all this manic energy oh my god oh my god and he runs down the hallway to some meeting of scientist types or something yeah it's a bunch of old stuff shirts i can't believe it i finally found it uh nothing <laughs> uh nothing all right bye everybody and then he just leaves and goes back to this office if you see that at your work you call security you call the cops you call an ambulance tim robbins is not only a danger to others he is most likely a danger to himself here's what i will say about tim robbins in this movie is that i think he's the only actor who's bringing any actual energy to the movie everything else feels so dull and flat like every other performance i don't think leah thompson isn't trying or anything it's just she has no character in the film other than to be mildly concerned about howard at all times this movie came out a year after Wee's big adventure was released and i kept thinking that some of his manic mannerisms were potentially influenced by paul rubin's performance in that movie great at least it's a performance you know he's trying to do something but it doesn't make sense a little later a cop refers to him as a kid and i'm like a kid he's like 30 so tim robbins goes back to his lab where howard and leah thompson are waiting and is talking to howard like me friend you duck and Howard's not saying anything, and then he uses, like, a Donald Duck voice, uh -huh. which I really can't do very well. If nor, nor should you. If, if anyone out there can do that, no one wants to hear you do that ever. Right. Tim Robbins then, once Howard is like, look, I'm not an idiot, man. Tim Robbins is like, all right, Howard, let me ask you a couple of questions. Can you burn a hole through this piece of wood with your eyes? Or do you have any other kind of superpower? Like, can you read my mind? Do you know that I'm a little turned on by thinking of you and Leah Thompson together? 
And the lighting in this scene is awful. It looks like a student film, not a major Hollywood production. There's a lot of weird shot selections too. Like there's a lot of stuff in the diner scene in particular I was noticing with a lot of like profile close-ups and stuff. I was like, what is this? Silence of the Lambs? Hey, let me ask you a question. Hey, listen up. Little one. Peep squeak. All right, quit crying. <laughs> Have you ever seen uh Silence of Lambs? No, Dad. It's I'm a child. In that movie, there's a guy who tucks his dick between his legs to look like a woman. Don't ever lose your virginity to something like that. All right? <laughs> I'm speaking from experience. It will fuck you up. That's a big part of why me and your mom aren't together. Are you saying that my mom tucked her penis between her legs? No, I'm just saying that you know how you got your first boner looking at duck titties? Well, you know, I got my first boner with a guy who had a boner tucked up between his cheeks. I didn't get a boner, Dad. I'm 10. You got a boner. Who are you trying to fool? I saw it more like Oshkosh, oh my gosh, you know what I'm saying? You're telling me that you and me, two red-blooded Americans, sitting here watching this movie, and you saw that duck with tits, and you didn't get a boner like I'm the only one? Come on, man. Yeah, I'm going to take you down and get an NBA test, find out if you're really my kid. After asking Howard to tell the future, uh, Howard's like, I see myself leaving with Leah Thompson. She goes after him while Tim Robbins gives chase. They end up in this closed wing <laughs> of the museum tim robbins then says if you were to fall into the hands of any other scientist what they'd want to do is cut you up just to see what color the organs were i just want to exploit you for fame and fortune right the american way and he says i have a theory about how on howard's planet ducks were the species that climbed the evolutionary ladder instead of primates here on earth and we see represented by that there's an that ascent of man drawing above right. I think it's a lion exhibit, weirdly, but that morphs into the ascent of ducks in similar fashion. Why explain any of this? It doesn't enhance how Howard the Duck came to be. He just he lives on a duck planet that's like ours, but with ducks. Just that's it. Yeah, we already got the explanation from the narrator at the beginning. He's like, "Hey, there's a bunch of crazy worlds out there. This one has ducks. That's all you need. You don't need somebody breaking down the evolution of these ducks into talking ducks that." can't fly anymore it's just it just needs to be a thing i want to point something out here when you see howard the duck walking through this museum his gait is that of a 12 year old boy and i mentioned in the introduction that two people primarily played him this 12 year old kid and a 22 year old male who was a little person and the gait of howard the duck steps the way that he runs and moves is noticeably different based on the two actors in the costume oh for sure and i know that it's a small detail but he doesn't even move the same throughout the movie the way the head moves the way the arms and hand moves it's like that bob dylan movie i'm not there with all those different actors playing bob dylan it's a lot like that Bo. except that was on purpose whereas <laughs> this is just poorly directed and poorly acted and edited and written and lit right music's bad hair's bad makeup's bad <laughs> yeah all of that is true so they're interrupted from their musings about the evolution of ducks uh -huh. by some doctors who tell tim robbins like hey some of uh, some kid threw up over in one of the other exhibits we need you over there to clean it up and then howard's like wait a second are you telling me that you're not even a real scientist that you're just a janitor oh no 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 I i'm a lab assistant it's a temporary job until i finish school and i get my own museum this movie is full of delusional people in their 20s. None of this shit's going to work out for them. They're a bunch of bumble-headed nincompoops. It's like singles with an anthropomorphic duck. <laughs> so Leah Thompson and Howard the Duck bail on Tim Robbins, who kind of chases them out. And he's like, I'll call you later. I'm going to figure out a way to help. When they're leaving the museum, there's this old woman with a mink stole. And she sees Howard. And then she screams in fright. So some people are shocked to see him, but other people aren't. You can't have it both ways, Howard the duck the movie well you know we all contain multitude chad some of us are terrified by the startling presence of alien ducks before us and some of us kind of roll with it i'm a roll with it guy i'm very adaptable leah thompson she gets real bent out of shape and she says you know howard duck i was just trying to help why are you so pissed off because remember the night before the music told us she was falling in love with him i miss those days but 
In this scene, Leah Thompson's wardrobe is best suited for pushing a shopping cart filled with junk down the street, ignoring voices in her head. It's so eclectically weird with layers and gloves that don't match, and her she's got like a swim fin on one foot and a knee brace on the other. It's yeah. it's so intentionally kitschy that you're like, just stop. No one dresses like this that unless they have no other clothes to put on. Well, we've seen where she lives. I think she's got like three outfits that there's a lot of mixing and matching, a lot of stuff that isn't necessary reversible that she calls reversible i thought you were saying it's not necessarily clothes oh well that too the fact that she's not wearing an old television that doesn't work on her head is is really kind of surprising did you know an empty quaker oats box can also be gloves i don't know about that sweetheart even on my planet you seem poor and crazy <laughs> howard is a little pissed off at leah thompson and he says hey like, i got blasted millions of miles through space all right and i'm over here getting a iq test from this janitor you know what we're kind of done here so beat it and she leaves because she's all upset that her career's falling apart and she's got problems and then howard the duck is an asshole and then these kids come over and they start rubbing on howard the duck but he screams at them and then they run away i also didn't mention in the introduction of this film that all of the voice acting for howard the duck was recorded recorded after the movie was shot so they matched the voice to go along with the action of the actors and the puppet head which is the kind of the opposite of how animation is done it's all very stilted and awkward it's very darth vader you know there's a lot of hand expression and stuff like that yeah so he he also in this scene scares a guy eating a sandwich how did that guy not have a flask in his hand giving it the old what's in this thing is there a moment other than the mad max glam punk that we saw earlier in the movie saying that he'd been doing too much toot i don't think there's anybody that gives it a a real like well it looks like i gotta stop drinking we are about what i don't know a third of the way through this nightmare and our two protagonists the male and female protagonists they already hate each other which is something that normally should occur at the end of act two you don't do that at the end of act one it takes till about the hour 10 mark for the second movie to take over yeah but the first movie and it feels too compact it feels like they had two movies that they just smooshed together and they didn't work well together at all and i don't know that they would have worked independently but the first movie is oh they wouldn't have (laughs) the first movie that we are witness to is the story of howard the duck coming to earth being the fish out of water and this relationship between him and leah thompson and we'll get to the second movie in a minute but this movie then takes the romantic comedy turn of now their relationship is on the rocks howard declares well i'm better off on my own so what i'm gonna do is take care of business and that means getting a job so we go to the fish out of water portion of the film where the next thing we know he is at the bureau of employment services in cleveland that's got to be a fun place to visit sure and he's accosted by a woman named cora may Mm -hmm. who says all right i'm gonna do what nobody thinks can be done they send me all the misfits and weirdos and you know what i'm gonna find you a job now despite the fact that you look controversial is how Uh, she puts it you got little fuzzy hands and your feet both look like plastic molds that does not deter me i will find you a job the way she puts it chad is i'm gonna find your ass a job Uh uh-huh she turns around Bo, to get an envelope and howard's like oh this is a great opportunity for me to bite her right in the ass but he gets all horny He's like, mmm, look at that big old set of hams. How is it horny or is he angry or is it some combination of the two? No, I think he is disillusioned or horny. Those are his only two states of being. Hey, hey, Billy. Hey, look at that ass, huh? Looks like your mama's ass, don't it? I remember when her ass used to not be that big. She was tight. She was real tight. Please quit talking about mom that way. You can bounce a quarter off of that ass, but I'll tell you, if you didn't get it just right, that quarter would disappear on you. Because your mother, uh, let's just say she wasn't a virgin when I met her. You know what I'm saying, Billy? Hey, 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 Billy, Billy. Seriously, man, quick, stop crying. Your mom ever talk about me? <laughs> she just says that you owe us a lot of money in back pay. Yeah, that's true. She ain't never getting none of that money. If she got better <laughs> luck bending over and trying to shit out some of them quarters I bounced off and got hidden in her crack. You know what I'm talking about? Let's see what happens. This duck's going to be into all kinds of adventures. Instead of biting her in the ass, though, she turns around and jams a file in his mouth. And she says, I got a job for you that you're going to take to like a duck to water. Cut to Howard the Duck working as a jizz mopper at a massage parlor. Folks at home. 
for one second, let's just peel back the curtain here. I know it sounds like we're just making this up. No. But God is my witness. This movie takes a turn where you're 100% right. He just goes to work at a brothel. Wait, you say a brothel. That sounds classy. That sounds like best little whorehouse in Texas. (laughs) This is seedy spa in a strip mall that's really full of all the VDs. Would you say this is less a brothel and more a fuck pit? Absolutely. If those are the two (laughs) ends of the scale, we are completely completely outside of the not only just the the zip code of brothel we're in another state away from brothel he's pushing a cart of towels Mm -hmm. past a couple groping in the hallway on a bench and uh you you can barely see them nipples in that scene but you get a lot of side boob he's got a jacket on bow that says hot tub fever which i'm hoping is (laughs) the name of this establishment and not the disease that started there (laughs) they one of these people is patient zero for hot tub fever the owner tells howard hey there's an egg check clogged in one of the tub you need to go down and fix it and my imagination ran wild with what could be clogging the air jet on a hot tub at this stank whorehouse it's gonna be underwear or poop i was thinking just coagulated semen i mean that's gonna take a lot of time but maybe so maybe you're right maybe over time it has built up in the jets and one thing led to another you need to get a little calcium remover hair band-aids condoms (laughs) wedding rings oh my god can you imagine just reaching into the filter of this thing and pulling out a handful of what you find there is a a high likelihood that some form of life is going to be created in that filter nature finds a way bro like the thing that climbed off the plate and better (laughs) off dead like something like that would come out of this filter the owner he gets real pissed off like everybody in this movie is about the life choices he made and he just grabs howard and throws him into this hot tub where two people are having sex i don't know why the owner does this but howard shouts out i can't swim that may be ironic and it may come back later in the movie it doesn't it's mentioned again you could have had a character that can't fly that can't swim that sort of redeems himself but they don't they don't do anything right so we cut to the owner of this whorehouse slash hot tub petri dish and he's in this room that has a mud bath in it but it really looks like an abandoned swimming pool filled with the porta john contents after a three-day tri-state county chili cook-off if chet from weird science rose out of it it would not be a shocker it's vile and he reaches in and pulls out this bra covered in mud it's a shit pit and so howard the duck runs in and Bo he hits the floor and slides across the tiles that are covered in semen and knocks this owner into this mud slop oh it's a real slip and slide moment and yeah knocks him into the mud bath the guy rises out of the shit pit and is like hey what do you think you're doing i'm the boss of this place howard's like i quit hey hey billy Let me tell you something. You ever go to a place like that? Don't use your real name. Pay in cash. Lessons learned. All right. My name, and when I go to them places, Billy, is Marlboro Man. You know why? Because this mustache is pretty good mustache. Uh, uh, This is the first thing your mother said she liked about me. She said, you know, I'm going to ride that thing. You know what? She did. I got to tell you, though, she was sour. She was a sour woman at the time. And I don't mean her demeanor. I mean her vaginal flavor billy dad this is the worst day of my life oh you think it is the worst day how old are you 13 no, i'm i'm eight dad I'm eight. Uh, whatever uh, you got a long road ahead of you and there are gonna be way worse days than this let me tell you right now i'll remember distinctly one day your mama coming in and telling me i'm pregnant you got one of them days ahead of you billy that was a real shitty one today's my birthday dad that's why we're at the movies i'll tell you what after we get that duck costume and uh and go out and get get you some titties to look at we're i'll tell you what i'm gonna give you five dollars and you can spend on whatever you want you put on that duck costume i'm gonna take you over to my favorite club it's called strokes we're gonna go in there I'm going to get you a lap dance. That is dramatic. We cut to a scene where Howard the Duck is getting off of a bus and everybody in the bus is screaming in fright, but then they all start laughing at him and mocking. And when he gets off, Howard the Duck's like, eh, up yours. And a couple people stick their heads out of the bus window and they're like, hey, is that a duck? The exact quote, because it's my favorite line in the whole movie, is the guy yelling, that's a duck. That's 
that's a duck, man. He's genuinely taken aback by it. It's the first natural reaction of any character in the movie. As he exits the bus, he starts wandering the streets again. He passes by this store display that's a bunch of televisions with news reports of like duck season starting. How dare this movie show us a Warner Brother Daffy Duck cartoon? Particularly the Robin Hood Daffy Duck episode, which is hysterically funny, as if I needed a reminder of how unfunny this movie is and that's another thing that we we haven't specifically said for this movie to be a comedy there is nothing funny at any point in this movie you can look all over this movie you can you can go underneath it you can look in the cushions you're not gonna find a laugh anywhere chad there are a few times where they attempt to do something that is pretending to be a humorous moment but it's not there's one character that comes closest for me and we'll get there in a little bit but it's one of the things that makes this movie such a slog is that nothing funny ever happens and howard himself is not a funny character at all he's just put off and pissed off and horny and none of that's particularly funny he's kind of like um dustin hoffman in the graduate he's just disillusioned and pissed off and mopey the whole time if dustin hoffman were uh, a duck like the quack just stop What I wouldn't have given, Chad, if at the end of this movie, it was Howard and Leah Thompson sitting in the back of a bus looking awkwardly at one another as the existential weight of their decision. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah. I've come to talk with you again. Because a mallard softly speaking. Quack, quack. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you what's a million times better than this. Everything? No, I want a new duck by Weird Al. More laughs in that three minutes than in this two-hour film. And that song is terrible. It's very funny. Um... So Howard the Duck gets spooked by all this anti-duck sentiment he's seeing on the television and he runs off down an alleyway and wouldn't you know it, Bo, he has made his way back to the same alleyway where he was originally abducted, which is identified by the tiny recliner that he was sitting on when he fell from outer space. Right. And Bo, across the street, Leah Thompson and her all-girl band Cherry Bomb is playing that very night. And it's all packed and we didn't mention this earlier, but in the bar there's a chain link fence between the band and the people people there to see them play to keep them from getting hit by beer bottles more than likely it's the same reason that there was the the chicken wire in the blues brothers right for that country and western bar yeah is that a real thing yeah yeah yeah, absolutely the song that she's singing is all about how people leave her and they look like ducks and sometimes they they yell at her before they leave and she (laughs) announces like this song is way too depressing let's play something peppy and so they start playing a more upbeat kind of a rock and song uh-huh. and howard has now come into the bar and overhears a conversation between the manager of the band the one that we heard mentioned earlier who rents the flop house to leah thompson he's credited as the entertainment booker but i guess he's the bar manager or something there's the entertainment booker who's in the bar there's the manager and then there's the third guy who is the the guy that stole cameron's dad's car and cranked up all those miles in ferris Bueller when he parked it in that garage yeah and all three of these dudes look like they are on their way to a zoot suit riot they're having the this conversation about how the owner of the bar is handing over money to the manager he says hey make sure that those little chippies get this money and the manager is like oh are you kidding me the only way that they're gonna get this money is if leah thompson has sex with me and i'm gonna work on sealing the deal tonight and howard the duck who is suddenly in love with leah thompson he walks over and he says hey you get your damn hand sorry he says <laughs> are you the manager uh because uh, i don't like the way you're talking about leah thompson up there and nobody in this bar is even phased by seeing a walking talking duck unlike all the other randos we've seen in this movie long story short howard the duck demands the money back manager says no a fight breaks out and then this kind of becomes sort of a western saloon style brawl it ends with howard stabbing the manager with an ice pick through his hoop earring 
ring and pins him to the bar. And then he demands, so you're no longer the manager. Give me all the money and I've saved the day. How much better a movie would this be if the sentence as you described it was Howard stabs him in the heart with an ice pick (laughs) and then begins to savage this place? How much better would this movie be if Crispin Glovin had played Howard the Duck wearing nothing but a sad prosthetic duck? Oh my God, that would have been fantastic. (laughs) I want that money or I'm going to fucking kill you. (laughs) Oh, it would be so good. Feck! Feck! Did you hit your head? My go-to for Crispin Glover these days is uh, River's Edge, where he's constantly trying to buy weed from Feck. Feck! Oh, it's so good. (laughs) Howard, where's the corkscrew? That's a little uh, Friday the 13th Part 4 for you. Pull down my pants and I'll show you. So everyone kind of flees. And it's at this point that Leah Thompson and the band stop playing because they're like, what's going on out there in the bar that everyone is, A, not watching us, and B, uh, looks like they're all fleeing in terror. And since they're not getting attention, they're like, whatever, we're just going to quit playing. And they just leave and go backstage. So back at the dressing room, Howard shows up at the door. Hey, baby, I missed you. I loved you. I need a place to sleep. Oh, my God, I missed you you so much too i'm so sorry that i did something that made you mad knock 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 hey everybody it's me tim robbins remember i'm in the movie he shows up with a pizza and says hey am i too late to see you undress uh god this movie oh by the way i'm dating one of the girls in the band that's why i'm here because we gotta smush movie number one and movie number two together and tim robbins is from movie number two or, or will be he says hey howard i've been doing a lot of theorizing i think i know you were actually trapped under ice like the thing and then you thaw it out and that's where you came from and howard's like no nah, man i told you where i came from okay right right, right. i said that was wrong but i'm really getting close to some concrete evidence about where you you came from you idiot i just told you where it came from right like it's a mystery like it should be we're trying to figure out how you got here not where you came from then howard tells all the girls in the band listen you're not gonna have to worry about that manager anymore and also here's some money that you're owed oh ducky you're the best i love you so much yeah 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 tim robbins is like hey i'm about to secretly meet with the other character in this movie and once i do that we're gonna see if this feather matches but he has to get a feather from howard first and kind of plucks it and howard's like hey get out of here and so tim robbins then grabs his feather takes off somehow in the mix of all this howard has completely angled himself into staying at leah thompson's apartment again he just asked okay i want to know how he angled himself into getting a pair of child-sized pajamas and a red plaid sleeping robe in fairness he does tell the woman at the employment bureau that he had to shoplift at the children's section of the goodwill also not a thing that necessarily makes you a likable character is to shoplift children's clothing do they have a duck goodwill back on his home planet is it called the good bill yeah it's got to be good bill good bill industries which is separate from the Quackvation army. Howard the Duck tells Leah Thompson, you know, back on my home planet, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I had a band called Howard and the Heartbreakers. Yeah, that's great. You should be our permanent manager. And then Leah Thompson starts crawling around on this fold-out hide-a-bed she sleeps on, wearing these tight purple panties that look suspiciously like the exact same pair of underwear that Marty McFly wore when he went back to 1955. Marty McFly was wearing women's underwear in 1955? Remember, he's crawling around she's like i've never seen purple underwear before calvin calvin why do you call me calvin that's your name isn't it calvin klein i should watch back to the future again instead of movies like this (laughs) howard's watching leah thompson crawl around on the bed she's turning down the covers and howard says hey you know i've developed a greater appreciation for the female version of the human anatomy and then he he goes oh (laughs) i think they're gonna fuck right and she totally takes him up on this offer where she's putting the moves on him like climbing into bed and stroking his head and whatnot and he's like whoa 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 slow down baby slow down right you're about to seal the deal what's going on here i got i got a headache uh and she says i'm the aspirin she leans in to kiss him in fact she's kind of more the aggressor here so she wants to have corkscrew dick sex and wouldn't you know it tim robbins and two other guys show up one of them speaking of ferris bueller's day off is principal rooney from that 
found. They break into her apartment. I mean, just open the door because it doesn't have locks. Tim Robbins is like, hey, the feather matched. They show Howard and Leah Thompson a video of the experiment that night where they were using uh, what's called a, a spectroscope to, in theory, measure gas deposits. And some force, as they describe it, directed the beam away from the intended target, thus grabbing Howard from his duck planet and bringing him to Earth. But in the lab, only a single feather fell. Unbeknownst to them, two miles away, Howard landed in this easy chair in the alley. You think it was God that moved that beam? Kind of like the setup for Quantum Leap? I don't <laughs> think... <laughs> Oh boy. I don't think that's the case. I think that it's poorly explained, but the idea is that the demon overlords that we'll get to in movie number two, as uh -huh. that's kicking off, that they're the ones who basically were trying to steal that beam. Absent the proposed idea that God did this, this is really the same plot of the theme park ride alien encounter, extraterrestrial that used to be at the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. Man, that was a great attraction. If you're keeping score at home this ride opened a year before this movie came out which may be a coincidence or maybe not i don't know if we've ever discussed alien encounter on this show before no we have not this was truly one of my favorite things at disney before they realized how traumatic it was to all the children who went on it sure like it was genuinely creepy and scary which is why it was so traumatic for children but yeah. for listeners who didn't know what it was it was a big round room that had seats in it that uh, had like shoulder rests that would come down over your shoulders you didn't move you didn't go anywhere it just had speakers in the shoulder rests and the chairs would move during the show and the whole premise was like you said it's kind of the howard the duck we're going to try to bring an alien into this container for your observation but as happens with science and science fiction and theme park rides and theme park rides naturally the alien in the ride breaks out and the lights go out and for a while you can hear thanks to the speakers built into the chairs this thing kind of flapping around and moving around as well as breath on the back of your neck and the shoulder rest thing what was cool about that is in theory the alien flying around would land on your chair and you would feel the pressure of that on your body it ate some workers and you felt blood fall down on you that's right oh man that was a fantastic ride yeah they got rid of that and then they replaced it with a stitch ride and he blows chili dog breath in your face now not the same effect no and far fewer tears and that was always my favorite thing about coming off of alien encounter was checking to see which children were crying i think much like shawshank at the beginning of the ride we took bets on who was going to be the first one to break <laughs> yeah it was like oh hey come on new fish where's the new fish that's my boy right there Come on, new fish. <laughs> that alien step on your chair. Let me hear it, new fish. You feel that blood? I got a pack of smokes riding on you. Howard the Duck says, all right, so you guys have the technology to send me back. Tim Robbins is still angling to get rich. He's like, we've got spots tomorrow on Good Day Cleveland, San Diego. No, 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 I, I want to get back home. So Leah Thompson says, so Ducky, I'm going to pack a bag for you and I'm going to put in some of your jammies and I'm going to put in some of my slightly dirty underwear because I think you might like that. And I'm also going to put in a stack of these Polaroids for you to take with. Uh, your mama used to take Polaroids of her naked and give them to me, and I used to sell them for ammunition. Sometimes I would just give them away as a little gift. You know, when I was picking you up from school on Friday afternoon, I think I gave one of those pictures to your biology teacher. N next time you're in class, you may want to say, hey, you ever seen my mama naked? Because I'm curious. I'm sure you're curious. I'm curious. You've, you, Dad, you've never picked me up at school ever oh right 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 that was the thing i was supposed to do and then just got drunk instead how did you get home i walked like i do most days yeah that's good for your heart that's good cardio hey hey i bet i bet before they leave there's gonna be a a goodbye fuck between this duck and this girl I, i'll tell you what how about you look the other way i'm still thinking about her and them panties i may just won't crank one out real fast here so uh just pretend uh, hey earmuffs for a second all right I'll i'll give you a little tap with the other hand when i'm done 
So we get some more inappropriate uh, romantic music. And Howard the Duck says, uh, you know, Leah Thompson, I don't really belong here. Uh, I'm going to beat it. I want to go back to my miserable life on my egg-shaped planet. Everyone heads back to the Planet Science Terrium to send Howard the Duck back home. And we get more sentimental bullshit between Howard the Duck and Leah Thompson about uh, they're having a hard time saying goodbye to one another after knowing each other for 48 hours. Once they get to Dynatectics or something. Dynatechnics. Where- that's right there's no guard at the gate which you're like oh something's up and then once we get inside the building there's all manner of alarms going off and this lab tech comes running out and his face is all burnt up and he screams out we shouldn't tamper with the universe and then he falls to the ground to melt onto the floor people are rushing all over the place they get inside the lab where this big machine the spectroscope is sparking there's a really unexpected david pamer sighting yeah that was odd yeah as one of the lab tech who says yeah the bottom of this spectro- spectroscope just blew off and then principal rooney disappeared uh-huh. then another of the texts is like well i wonder if we brought something else down and so then chad one of the most pointless characters of the movie in a film filled with pointless characters shows up mm-hmm. the detective as the cops show up to investigate leah thompson is confronting this detective and and wants to know why are you guys harassing howard this strange alien that is there at the site of a laboratory accident this detective goes into an office with a bunch of cops and takes howard in with him who by the way the whole time is just like hey i want to see my duck lawyer the detective is like all right all right take off his duck suit strip this guy down get him out of this stupid costume a couple of cops start taking all 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 of his clothes Uh uh-huh Except for his boxer shorts, which right. apparently he also stole. Which, let me ask you this, Chad. The answer's no. <laughs> How many pairs of children's boxers have you purchased for, you know, your child over the course of his life? Oh, zero. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask me, would I ever wear a pair of boxers that I stole from the Goodwill? Yeah. Also, no, you, that you're going to get yourself a, a little bit of hot tub fever that way, Chad. That's when you got a whole bunch of the VDs and you're like, maybe I'll put these on and the VDs on this will fight the VDs on my dick. And they'll just battle it out and I'll come out on top. After stripping them down, the detective says, take this duck to jail and they're like what for for being an illegal alien build that wall build that wall howard drops a lit cigar into a trash can which causes the cop that's watching over him to turn around and bend fully into the trash can oh what a delight that's the kind of stupid shit that passes for humor in this Leah Thompson steals his gun and they just escape. Well, I'm like, well, hey, you got a felony against you, sweetie. At one point, Leah Thompson, while holding a gun on this cop, says, Buck him, ducko. And that is both a great example of the kind of humor you can expect from this movie and yet another joke that I'm sure really scored with the 12 year olds in the audience. Yeah. Tim Robbins is being questioned. The detective is then informed that Howard the Duck and Leah Thompson escape and a manhunt, aka a duck hunt, ensues meanwhile leah thompson and howard the duck are hiding under some stairs where they overhear this detective saying i want you to go after this duck and if you see him shoot to kill that's right and if you kill him grab him and sexually violate him that's what you should do to this duck what a piece of shit i hate this duck for no good reason they take off leah thompson and howard the duck do where they run into principal rooney Uh who's all jacked up and burned and his hair's all crazy and he says oh i blacked out when the explosion happened and then he goes and they're like what's going on with you what the fuck what why did you make that weird noise? I don't know what you mean. I, I didn't make any kind of weird noise at all. We better get out of here. I know there's a back gate. You clearly made a really weird noise, Principal Rooney. I don't think I did. <laughs> there it is again. The fucking noise. It came out of your mouth. Uh, that was, I think I I ate a lot of broccoli. I had some stir fry and there was a lot of all broccoli right. and cauliflower and that just makes me a little gassy. Yeah, that's probably what you're hearing. <laughs> that's not a fart. All right. It, it, your, your fucking eyes are rolling back in your head and you're glowing blue and shit. Like, what the fuck is going on here? You know what? I think uh, I've got a little touch of the hot tub fever. All right, look, my broad here, she's got a gun. All right, let's get out of here. If you see a cop, we're going to shoot it. If we kill him, you can have sex with him. Nah. 
And so they buzz through said back gate when the detectives go in pursuit of them. Then Principal Rooney says, I saw something right before the explosion happened, something coming down into our world. And I think the world is in great danger. And then he starts bah! again. But this whole time, though, they are riding around in a truck and we are then treated to a very long one car chase sequence. There's no one in pursuit of them. They're just driving away from nobody. Principal Rooney. Ah, I'm transforming <laughs> inside. Ah. It feels like there's something gnawing at my guts. Ah. He just <laughs> lets go of the wheel. And so Howard is trying to steer this truck that they're in while Principal Rooney is just. Ah, bah, bleh, bah. <laughs> Like Howard tells Leah Thompson to hit the brakes. They jump this gully. They end up nearly crashing into a diner, but stop just short, tapping this plexiglass that wobbles. And then they're like, are you okay, Principal Rooney? And he goes, the transformation is complete. There is no Principal Rooney. Ah. Leah Thompson is like, well, I guess he needs some coffee. Let's get into Joe Roma's Cajun Sushi Diner. <laughs> How crazy and weird is that, Bo? This scene. They, dude, inside, it is a mess of production design it's a 50 style diner with a grill and a bunch of pies there's sushi being made there's all kinds of weird asian touches around i don't know what the joke here is supposed to be it's a nightmare scenario for robert irvine that's a restaurant impossible reference i didn't get it that's why i explained it thank you so much this is really for me who has never seen anything i recently saw that anthony bourdain documentary and literally like a day or two before i saw parts unknown for the very first time huh. so i didn't know who anthony bourdain really was whenever you hear about a celebrity hanging themselves and dying do you think that it was autoerotic asphyxiation i assume that there's a high likelihood uh -huh. anytime you say he was found hung it's either depression aka anthony bourdain or robin williams or it's you know the michael hutchins route the carradine as they call it they go inside this diner which by the way bo sells budweiser beer budweiser when you're looking to get drunk at a bowling alley there's only one beer on tap budweiser when you've said budweiser you've said it all describing a beer as a bud heavy still makes me laugh though the hostess <laughs> and i use that term loosely is like hey what's going on with this crazy ass duck and howard says i'm a cni duck then they go to their booth where a waitress comes over and she's kind of the hippy dippy new age waitress character and maybe outside of tim robbins the only other performer in the movie that's really trying to sell this yeah she's actually does a good job with her performance i looked up who she is she died in her 20s or 30s jorley mclean is her name she died at the age of 53 what yeah hold on a minute all of my facts are wrong and i may have that wrong but when i would looked her up on imdb earlier the suggestion was that she had died at 53 was it autoerotic asphyxiation yes it was yes i knew i would get some of this right <laughs> apparently what happened was she was in a couple of movies and then partnered with some other woman to start a business uh -huh. and it became wildly successful and she was like fuck this acting thing i'm just gonna go be rich did they sell belts to put around your neck while you masturbate no i think it was like quilts or something it was the kind of thing that when i read read it i thought i didn't know you could become a millionaire doing that which is why i'm not a millionaire you know who could learn a lesson from her story every character in this film she had a dream of being an actress shit didn't work out she found another way to make money and she did it and she's successful right she never would have made it into that cameron crow <laughs> movie but she's she's great in this she's she's one of my favorite characters in a movie that has a surprising lack of them well howard the duck he yells at her as a waitress hey honey yo like, get your ass over here and and she walks over and she's like hey do you want something to eat and at this point principal rooney has completely transformed to this dark lore demon space thing that's inside of him we'll explain all that sort of later and he says i no longer need human food <laughs> you are about to bear witness to the end of your world and the birth of a new one <laughs> And so she's like, okay, so three specials then? And so they order three specials, three beers, and they're like, Jennings, you're really kind of cracking up on us. And he says, nah, I am not Jennings anymore. I am one of the dark overlords of the universe. We come from the nexus of Sominus, a realm of demons. During the explosion at your lab, I entered Jennings' body. <laughs> 
It's a very long villain speech. And it comes, Chad, at an hour and 10 minutes into an hour and 50 minute long film. And you're like, where is this movie coming from? When did this become a save the world movie? Oh, now? Okay. Evil Principal Rooney. He shoots laser beams from his eyes and blows up a ketchup and mustard bottle. We spend way too much time screwing around in this diner. It is a painfully long sequence. At one point, a couple of rednecks from Superman 2 show up and start fucking with Howard the Duck. Yeah. The whole diner gets in on the act where they're just like, we're going to kill this duck. Yeah. Well, there's a big food fight that starts with three rednecks and then it involves a bunch of pies in the face because that's what passes for entertainment in this movie. It then just turns into a lynching. Can you imagine that stopping off to get a piece of pie and some coffee and you're suddenly just part of mob mentality of strapping down this oversized duck to kill it? That had to be a, a day you put in your diary. Don't forget that one. Hey, Billy, you know a day I remember one time I was driving back to my house and I hit four deer like on my way home and I set my car on fire and I never, ever heard from any of those people again. I thought you said they were deer, dad. Yeah, they were deer friends. It worked. <laughs> Let me tell you an important life lesson. Learn to keep your mouth shut when you know shit, okay? I just want to go home. Mom said she was going to make me a birthday cake. Wait, who? It's not my birthday. Damn. I... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, maybe my favorite line and, and or moment in the whole movie comes here where after Howard has been taken away by this bloodthirsty mob intent on killing him, the waitress comes back to the table and while she's standing there, evil Principal Rooney says, there is an evil beyond anything you know about to engulf the earth. And the waitress says, oh no, we get fights in here like this all the time. <laughs> and it it's a good delivery it's not a great line but she does what she can with it thousand dollars says she ad-libbed that line you're probably right because there's it's, no way that was in the script it's way too good <laughs> and <laughs> the other thing that's happening here is we get the introduction of the code key which is kind of the macguffin of this scene and nothing more <laughs> I need that key to run the machine to bring more demons to Earth. <laughs> Leah Thompson, in order to save Howard from the chef that's about to use a meat cleaver to cut off his head now that they've got him bungee down to a chopping block. And Leah Thompson is like, oh my God, evil Principal Rooney, Howard the Duck has your code key. And he's like, bah, what? and he gets out of the booth and just starts blowing shit up he goes full carry white this is another complaint i have with a movie that's just filled with them get in line what is the rule of this monster is it telekinetic yes can it shoot lasers out of its eyes yes can it also shoot fireballs out of its eyes yes can it just use its hands to whip people around yes all of this can happen it can do anything there are no rules it can shoot electricity out of his hands both in streams and large pulses yeah he's got some kind of pulse ray like iron man it's i i don't understand any of it when he gets up and starts glowing one of the cooks that works at this diner says huh i guess he must have eaten the chili which again not a terrible line if it were in a different scene in a different movie perhaps but instead it's in howard the duck and then a guy comes at evil principal rooney with a meat cleaver this is where uh he's like ah, zap and just blows him up a little bit and like knocks him back into the counter and then evil principal rooney takes control of the meat cleaver and starts spinning it around and it cuts off some lamps and then it flies towards howard who thinks it's going to stab him but instead it chops the bungee cord between his legs thereby freeing howard and this is where the fire comes out of his eyes where he's like that ah, i can do anything ah, and just starts blowing the place up people start lean can i describe that scene from my notes please Evil Principal Rooney starts blowing shit up and Howard gets free. That's the Reader's Digest version of <laughs> that explanation. So Leah Thompson rushes to Howard who has the code key. Oh, Ducky, he wants to get the key from you. Don't let him do that. They try to sneak off, but then Evil Principal Rooney sees him as like, that, ah, not so fast. Ah. And the door closes, tables slam against the door again, very Carrie White. And then Evil Principal Rooney lifts Howard up into the air with his mom 
mind powers, then start spinning him around and around until this code key just shakes loose. Uh huh. At which point he drops Howard the Duck onto a table, grabs the code key, and he's off while Leah Thompson calls after him. You're a filthy scum bucket, evil Principal Rooney. Ah, what did you say? I think I'm going to use you as a host for a demon. Ah, bah, bah. Bo, there are 40 minutes left in this movie. And don't worry, listeners, we're going to get through this pretty fast. And these final 40 minutes are summed up on Wikipedia in one paragraph composed of about four sentences. We have introduced this end of the world scenario deep into act two. In terms of just script structure, I know that everybody comes to this podcast for script analysis. Or they're lost. You're right. <laughs> you know the way that you would set this up is early in act one you would kind of establish that there was some evil force yep you don't have to say what it is you just have to say that there was something else that was coming down with howard give it some indication that there is this larger apocalyptic force at work we're an hour 10 hour 15 into this movie before you ever bring that up that's why you have this incredibly awkward speech that principal rooney gives about being the dark overlord of the universe and where they come from and what they want and how they got banished to the realm of shadows and all that crazy shit it would be like if in ghostbusters you edit out all of the backstory of gozer and you only introduce that at the very end of act two or the very start of act three or hell halfway through act three the rest of it's just them running around shooting ghosts i'll go you one better chad all right it's as if in the film jaws the first hour and 10 minutes was nothing but beach life and <laughs> making signs and stuff and then <laughs> deep in act two somebody's like holy shit did you know we had some people missing <laughs> what what are you talking about oh, oh yeah, there i think there's a shark <laughs> what i guess we better get on this boat with quint then next scene farewell and adieu to you fair <laughs> spanish ladies like it is that abrupt and out of nowhere evil principal rooney grabs leah thompson and kidnaps her and he says ah, i need you to be a host body we can't live unless we're in a body ah, ah. and they hop into this big rig and they're driving off down the road and evil principal rooney says mm, i need energy ah. he pops off the top of a cigarette lighter and then extends out of his mouth this tongue that's about five feet long looks like a giant worm and he plugs it into the lighter socket and sucks the energy out of the car it is all quite frightening <laughs> yeah hey i remember when your mama she had a long tongue like that boy what she could do she was one of the only women i have ever known billy that could blow me and also lick my balls at the same time now, that is a trick. I, I'll tell you, I'm I'm bored to shit by the Olympics, but if you show me something like that, I ought to get a 10 from the Russian judges. Back at the diner, it's the next morning, and Tim Robbins is there, and he's in the back of a police car. Howard the Duck shows up, and he says, evil Principal Rooney kidnapped Leah Thompson, and, and now he's a demon monster or something. He's going to bring more demons or something from space. We got to stop him. <laughs> right. And then Tim Robbins, who is a man of science, he doesn't question any of this. He's like, oh, okay, whatever. Hey, let's go over that junkyard i think there's an ultralight aircraft that we can use to fly away on boy somebody's weekend hobby is going to save this script i mean us we cut to the next day where evil principal rooney is driving in the semi and passes a nuclear power plant he's like nah. uh, the cuyahoga nuclear which is actually 10 miles outside of cleveland you know his geographical accuracy is a hallmark of howard the duck he took the scenic route <laughs> yeah we went over the golden gate bridge we came through chinatown now we're at the Cuyahoga nuclear power plant. I love the fact that he drives the semi through the gates of a nuclear facility. It would immediately alert local, state, and federal officials. Nobody but, notices. No. Nobody pays attention. He gets inside and goes on a tour. Yeah. <laughs> Just slips in before we get to the tour we cut over to tim robbins and howard the duck taking off in the paraglider and there's a whole uh -huh. bunch of business about them driving around and howard doesn't want to fly and then tim robbins is like they're gonna shoot you pull up howard and so they fly off and then the detective says i want that duck dead or alive also the last time we see that detective preferably dead because i want to have sex with his corpse what did you say, detective? You heard me. Hey, hey, Billy. I did that one time. Now, it wasn't technically a, a person, but it was definitely dead. I'm going to go check on the dog, dad. Speaking of dead, hey, I got, I know how much change is in the ashtray. I need an adult. <laughs> 
I need an adult. Yeah, he's a good kid. Why wouldn't you have Howard the Duck be a duck from a planet where ducks can't fly and make part of his story he wishes he could fly? And then when he gets on the ultralight, he's flying and he's very good at it. And it becomes sort of a moment of transformation where he went from being a screw up to doing something very valiant and beneficial to others. I mean, it's a great question, but I think the answer is that nobody knew how to make this character a character that you cared about but yeah something like that where he's like you know it's always been my dream to fly you know yeah. that would be great that would be a real something and, and like you said when it happened in the movie then you would have an emotional reaction to that because that's how construction of characters work somebody pointed out recently every in almost every movie the main character is somehow transformed by an event or learns to care it's one of those two things in this movie none of those things happens to any character ever other than evil principal rooney who's transformed into a monster but spoilers it don't last long he's just regular old principal rooney at the end of the movie this chase scene with the ultralight involves a lot of car crashes and motorcycle crashes both howard the duck and tim robbins are riding on this thing i don't know how howard the duck and tim robbins know that evil principal rooney and leah thompson are at this nuclear power plant but they do so that's where they're headed no i think they're going back to dynatechnics oh is that where they're headed yeah speaking of the nuclear power plant though at this poorly guarded facility leah thompson has just been tied up in the back of the semi while evil principal rooney joins a tour group of washington scientists who are inspecting the plant one please how much is it that does that include lunches that your sign says tips recommended not required i have a tip for you you should make peace with your god he's on this tour and people wander off and he steps into a nuclear reactor or something and he gets all of the energy he needs to be super powered yeah and then goes back to the semi and just tells leah thompson who was on the brink of escaping but he gets in the semi before she can do that and he just says ah, i am feeling much better now ah, ah. this movie keeps cutting back and forth from the nuclear power plant nonsense and the ultralight action sequence and it's all unthrilling it's also very disruptive like even as you start to build a sense of action and adventure it's like let's get away from that to see a tour of a nuclear power plant we go from that back to the paraglider stuff which is just a lot more chasing around he does dive bomb a bunch of duck hunters that are on this lake and as this happens howard the duck says tora 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 how would Howard the Duck know to say Tora, Tora, Tora if on his home planet they didn't have an equivalent of World War II? Which means they had a Hitler the Duck <laughs> and quite possibly a Hirohito the Duck. That's a, another giant problem of this film, like I mentioned earlier, is just all these characters and even evil Principal Rooney a couple of times will kind of make a joke about something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you know about this? You're a demon from the Nexus of Sominus. Do you think on Howard the Duck's planet that Steven Duckberg made a movie called Saving Private Ryan Gosling? Oh, that's pretty good. I just came up with that one. That's not bad. <laughs> then, like, just fell into a period of doing nothing but historical dramas about, like, Quackraham Lincoln and <laughs> Bridge of Feathers. Enough of that glider shit. W let's go back to Evil Principal Rooney and Leah Thompson, who are on the highway in Ohio with all its deserts. Surprisingly, all of the cars are visiting from California, according to their license plates. Well, you know, it's a popular time of the year to visit Cleveland. <laughs> There's a vehicle inspection stop for emissions or something, which I, I never never heard of unless you live in california we do have listeners in ohio i know this for a fact so please listeners in ohio let me know the last time a police officer stopped you on the street or on the highway to measure your emissions there's a cop comes up to the semi because evil professor rooney hits a couple of cars to try to get them out of the way and the cop is like hey man you need to step out of that semi <laughs> i'm gonna blow up all the cars with my laser vision and then he does why is this scene in the movie they blow up like 10 cars that's why the scene is in the movie <laughs> You think they gave him the budget and they're like, hey man, if you don't spend it, then it's a knock against us. I know it's crazy, but you got to spend every dollar they budget. If you don't spend all of the money we gave you to make Howard the Duck, we're just going to end up feeding the homeless and providing low cost public housing. And I don't think any of us want that. Maybe 
this is kind of like a Brewster's Millions type thing where they were like, okay, here's the bet. We are going to give you $36 million and you have to spend every penny, but you can't make back any more than what you spent. Like you have to make a movie so bad that you lose money. All you can leave this film with is the clothes on your back. (laughs) And disgrace and shame for you and generations to come. Probably on the book somewhere in the production budget is like a letter they sent with a rare stamp. (laughs) <laughs> that's when they mailed in their final invoices son of a bitch oh you got me uh i like this idea that this is just a brewster's million scheme behind the scenes now that's a movie i would like to watch chad it's not as good as you don't remember it being i would watch a duck version of brewster's millions what would you call it shit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fair enough there's some more uh paraglider bullshit with uh the fuel hose breaking and tim robbins has to fix it and none also, of it I, just, I gotta go on the record and say this. this paraglider sequence goes on forever first they're over the city then they're over a lake then they're over the rolling hills of southern california i mean cleveland none of this matters because in the end they end up showing up at dynatech after crashing through a moving boxcar train that knocks off the wings but wouldn't you know it they're right beside dynatech and that's where evil principal rooney is and that's where leah thompson is so our movie is all coming together finally they rush inside where howard and tim robbins and they discover leah thompson tied to a platform with the spectroscope like aimed at her or whatever while evil principal rooney works the controls and is like nah, let's point this at the nexus of somnus nah, nah. yeah tim robbins remembers that they have this super weapon that they can use to fight evil principal rooney but they've got to go get it which is what they do they just immediately walk to this locked room that tim robbins has no knowledge of they kick the door open and find this neuron disintegrator whatever the hell that is it's just a big gun cannon and then they take it out to go fight evil principal rooney principal rooney in the meantime has inserted the code key they're about to point this thing at the nexus of somnus to pull down more of these demons howard and tim robbins mount this disintegrator ray onto a golf card (laughs) yes and end up somehow starting it without anybody in the driver's seat so it busts through the doors of the lab alerting evil principal rooney to the fact that tim robbins and howard the duck are now there Ah, ah, you're too late i'm about to call down the demons and your girlfriend is gonna be the host that day he also now has this weird spine thing grown out of his lab coat to emphasize the fact that he's now a monster evil principal rooney fires some of his magic at tim robbins but tim robbins grabs some kind of radar dish thing which absorbs slash reflects some of it back yep which pisses evil principal rooney off and then howard is trying to get the golf cart started and he get this fucking thing to work and tim robbins raises up with his hair all like electrified and smoking and stuff uh, it's a real yahoo serious young einstein moment it really is and i ha- that's another movie i haven't thought about in a very <laughs> long time but he's like try the seatbelt howard clonk And he passes back out. And so Howard the Duck does, in fact, put on the seatbelt, which allows him to start up the golf cart. There's like an Old West showdown with Howard the Duck and the golf cart and the laser cannon and Evil Principal Rooney. At first, Evil Principal Rooney tries to use his stink breath to keep (laughs) Howard the Duck at bay. But Howard the Duck rallies and then fires the laser. But so does Evil Principal Rooney. He fires his magic at him and there's a big explosion. Right. Evil Principal Rooney seemingly explodes. Yes. And so Howard the Duck staggers out from from behind this golf cart. Tim Robbins joins him. They go rescue Leah Thompson. And our movie is over, Bo. Or is it? Damn it, Chad. So before they can leave the building and end this movie, Principal Rooney is back and he's no longer evil. Oh my God. What what, what happened? I've been blacked out for... 24 to 48 hours and he says oh the evil is loose now and apparently on my hard drive sorry it's gonna be one joke and then so tim robbins then goes about the business of setting leah thompson free while something starts to rumble and roar beneath and then out comes chad a stop motion monster that is the actual form of the dark overlord of the universe it looks like a creature out of men in black it's giant and it's got spider crab legs and a big mouth surrounded with teeth and the demon monster says like 
there is no escape. Nah, nah. Hey. Howard the Duck gets back on the golf cart with the cannon. He blasts it at the space demon and he kills it. <laughs> right. There's more that happens here, but it don't matter. None of it is suspenseful. I like that he shoots, the monster shoots lasers out of its eyes at Leah Thompson and Tim Robbins. And they just become kind of cosmically bedazzled and shake a little bit yeah eh, i guess it's like they're gonna disintegrate or something but yeah you're right who cares they blow up the monster it, it feels so anticlimactic because he just aims the laser at him and then the monster blows up there's no trickery there's nothing that needs to be figured out there's no that's it we got him it's Mila time. <laughs> You're right. But they don't even have to cross the streams or anything. Like, you know, again, the perfect version of this is kind of Ghostbusters. We set up early on, hey, don't cross the streams because that will be the, the positronic reversal and everybody explodes. And then at the end of the movie, you got to do that anyway, knowing, hey, we may sacrifice ourselves, but we're going to save the world. And for Howard, there isn't that moment. It's just you aim it at the thing and it blows up. The closest you come to it is when... After after they blow up monster number one there's a ticking clock when he put the key in earlier it was four minutes until his buddies show up and then suddenly the clock is at 60 seconds and you're like well what does any of this matter and then howard the duck decides to blow up the machine so that he won't be able to get back to his world ever which he does and it blows up which is awesome because the clock is at 60 seconds Bo, and he blows it up at like second 48 it doesn't even get close to the countdown of the clock it's almost like they don't understand how to create tension in this movie they also don't create any sense of characters motivation or what they want because howard the duck earlier on said yeah you know my planet back home it was bullshit i had a shitty job and i hated everything about it leah thompson says ducky if you blow up the machine you can't go back to your shitty life hey yeah no fuck that boom yeah so it blows up leah thompson and tim robbins unbedazzle and they're okay now right they rush over to howard who looks dead in as much as he has the cold dead eyes of uh, a mannequin yeah of a puppet that's not being puppeteered <laughs> right it's the equivalent of like rushing over to peanut from jeff dunham <laughs> when you just opened the case and you're like oh my god he's dead it's like, hey, of course he is it's not a real thing and howard's a dick because th they think he's dead and howard goes eh, i'm not howard anymore meh, meh. you're like oh did he get a demon in him and then he coughs and goes <coughs> I'm just, I'm just fucking with you. All this smoke is, is murder on my sinuses. Then Leah Thompson just hugs him. End of scene, theoretically end of movie, but... No, 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 Bo. We cut to the war field over in San Francisco, Ohio. <laughs> Where a concert is underway. Cherry Bomb! As they are playing uh, a new song that they dedicate to their new manager, Howard the Doc. Don't you think he would have known that that was dedicated to him? They don't have to say that. Do you think at some point they were like, you know what? Uh, we've got a special song we want to play for you. Ah, uh, yeah. What is it? We don't want to spoil the surprise. All right. Hey, what's what's this with this giant duck egg that uh, we're about to drop on the stage? Oh, no, no, no. That that has nothing to do with you. We promise. It's like the, the shittiest surprise party that was ever planned. D Howard the Duck is <laughs> kind of dancing around on this platform. He's watching from the wings. Tim Robbins apparently has abandoned his science career and is now just a stage manager for this band he got fired bo he didn't clean up that <laughs> vomit that his boss told him to get he also exploded much of the lab so i guess that's that's mm -hmm. probably gonna be a black mark in your permanent record yeah howard the duck ends up on stage yeah hopping around on one leg like marty mcfly in a movie that came out the year prior yeah playing guitar to the theme song howard the duck he and leah thompson dance around credits start to roll and you're like oh thank christ it's over but then chad we gotta do a little thing off in the wing that means nothing i stopped it i don't know what's come, getting ready to happen i'm so excited <laughs> Leah Thompson and Howard the Duck go to the wings off stage. Uh huh. She leans down to him and says, Howard, you were great. And he goes, Uh huh. And then the screen goes black. And you're like, You kept me in my seat for that? For you did great, Howie? What in the hell is going on? And what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Why do we watch this trash, man? Because not all, some of it's legitimately fun. <laughs> Yeah, like, do you remember the good time we had with Jaws 3? That was a good time. Yeah. And Howard the Duck is truly one of the most 
god-awful pieces of entertainment that I've ever had the misfortune to see twice. It is misguided in every way. And we've seen some really bad movies that are swinging for the fences and they just miss. But this is, I think the only way to explain it is Brewster's Millions. I don't get how so many people spending so much money could get it so wrong. Boy, they did. You know, usually there's like, oh, well, this scene is is pretty good or this moment is kind of fun. There's just nothing to recommend this movie. It is it it's too long. It doesn't know who the target audience is. My theory was that it was a movie intended just to get people without homes off the streets into a cool place for a little while. <laughs> I think having done my research for the introduction that there possibly were good intentions of bringing this quirky underground comic to the big screen, but it's just one of those things that you shouldn't, it doesn't work in this medium. Well, as you you said in the introduction, like this isn't going to please fans of Howard the Duck. Not that I, I don't think there's a giant body of, of fans of that particular comic, no. but people who like like it aren't gonna have a good time with it you didn't do enough with the character to make him likable and sympathetic so families and kids who seem to be the target market for a movie about a little duck come to earth this movie isn't going to appeal to them because it's too bawdy and it's not funny and so there's just nothing for anybody of any stripe let me tell you what i like i like him duck titties <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, the, the biggest problem this movie's got is there were duck titties and purple underwear and corkscrew duck dicks. And then all of a sudden there was some space laser or some shit. Here's how you fix your movie. You take the duck titties, you take the panties, you take the corkscrew dick, you put all of them in a scene together and see what happens. You mix it up. All right. I put that in a blender the same way I do my Bloody Marys on Tuesday mornings. That's right. I get pretty drunk Monday night. Don't even worry about it, Billy. Billy, where'd you go? Billy! I'm probably going to have to explain this to his mama. Or maybe I, I'll, I'll just not call. Yeah, he probably walked home. He's a pretty good kid. So that's Howard the Duck. Truly one of the worst things we've ever watched for this podcast undeniably like you know i think back to your wing commanders and houses of the dead and that kind of thing and i think i would watch wing commander over this as dull an affair as that movie is uh -huh. it's at least consistently boring as opposed to just being occasionally offensive with its portrayals of sexuality and sexual assault bestiality and bestiality yeah it's just i again attempted rape why did anyone make this why did anyone think this how did you like watch the final cut of this and think like yep we did it we nailed it yeah i think when the lights came up in the screening room everyone behind it let out a collective oops yeah except for george lucas who was like i really think we got it guys i think this was it let me show you my first draft of the prequels uh, for star wars it's basically Howard the Duck. It's set in outer space on a planet made of people instead of ducks. There's some robots also. Um, they, one could look like a duck, maybe. A, a duck bot. I've taken the, the beautiful relationship between Howard the Duck and the character Beverly, and I'm just I'm, I'm lifting all that dialogue and putting it with Anakin and Padme. The chemistry here is undeniable. I have to say, Leah Thompson, I think, does her best here. I like Leah Thompson, and sure. I think she is she is absolutely going for it, like Tim Robbins is, Jorley McLean, as we pointed out, doing fine work in this film. Jeffrey Jones is kind of fine, but because of that monotone performance that he has to give, he's not really interesting. And also, a, you know, as we've learned, a disgusting person. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's really unfortunate that they just couldn't find their way to a character that made any sense. Bo, you know a character that makes a whole lot of sense? Oh, is there one knocking at the door? Would you care to tease episode two of season 17's theme comic, Sans Quality, for our listeners? Yeah, we're going to stick in, in the world of Marvel for a little bit. Uh-huh. Going back to the uh, the seventies, I believe is when uh, this creation happened, uh, and that's of course Ghost Rider. But you know that first movie, that's eh, fine and all. But you know what we need to talk about, Chad? What's that? 
we need to talk about the sequel, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, because that's when shit goes off the rails. Full disclosure, I did not know there was a sequel to the first Ghost Rider movie. If it does anything for you, it's directed by the team that produced uh, and directed Crank. I was worried you were going to say Howard the Duck. It is a wonderfully unhinged Nicolas Cage performance, and it's something that we haven't really had a chance to explore on this show a bunch. Every now and again, an actor, like when Michael Caine pops up uh, in, in last season, it's like, how did we miss all the Nicolas Cage stuff? We are going to dive you know head first into the world of Nicolas Cage being nuts yeah, I think he's only been on the podcast once in gone in 60 seconds no 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 we did wicker man sir oh that's right I forgot about that which is a much more uh, aside from the B thing it's a much more subdued performance Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance I can't wait after the just misery of Howard the Duck Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance is gonna be such a breath of fresh air it's not super long. It's crazy. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Come back and see us in two weeks' time, everybody. As always, like, rate, review. You can leave reviews over on Apple and Amazon and other places. You can send us an email at picksixmovies at gmail.com. We are still selecting the final four uh, movies for this particular season. So if you have a recommendation, send us a note and let us know. You can also find us on facebook and instagram and we're on twitter but we're never really doing anything there because we got shit to do that's not that uh bo any final thoughts that you have on howard the duck i hope that we've made it abundantly clear if you are listening to this you should never ever ever watch howard the duck yeah unless you like duck titties i just want to go home where'd you go i was trying to wake the dog up